We present The Smiler with the Knife by Nicholas Blake, dramatized by Barry Campbell, starring Jackie Smith Wood as Georgia Strangeways and Simon Cadell as Nigel Strangeways. The Smiler with the Knife. Mm. I say, listen to this. The Duchesse de Palma is very showy, orange red, edged with yellow. A splendid bedder. <laughs> she sounds just your type. Hmm. Shall we have the Duchess in the garden, Nigel? Nigel? Hmm? Oh, sorry, darling. You haven't heard a word I've said. Uh, no, sorry. It's this extraordinary letter. Oh, uh, not another case. What is it this time? Murder or blackmail? Oh, neither, neither. It's our hedge. Hmm? Listen. Pursuant to the provisions of an Act of Parliament... Pom, 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 pom. I, the surveyor of highways, do this day, the 15th of March, 1938, pom, 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 hereby give you notice and require you forthwith to cut, prune and trim your hedges adjoining the county roads. Goodness. What happens if we disobey the S of H? Um, yeah. We get complained off to a justice of the peace. Hmm. Mm. In that case, I think I'll have a go at the beastly hedge this morning. No coffee. Tell me, would you mind very much if I left you? No, I think I've already had two cups. For another man, you mean? I should be very cross indeed. <laughs> Don't be silly. Went off on my travels again, I mean. Any particular expedition in mind? Mm, not exactly, but... I suppose <sighs> I'd get to be all right. Would seem a long time, though, till you came back. Oh, Nigel, I'm so glad I married you. So am I, darling. Are you? Really? Really. Otherwise, I'd have to cut the edge myself. You beast! Oh! Ah, uh, Georgia, still hacking your way through the jungle? Oh, goodness, it's hard work. I must look like Medusa. Mm. Mm, here, look what I found. Very treasure. Is it gold, do you think? Well, some sort of locket. A very cheap one, not gold, alas. I wonder how it got here. Folk courting under the hedge. Chuck it away. Oh, let's look inside first. <laughs> I couldn't get it open. No, I put a pen knife. Oh, there, that's, that, that's got it. What's inside? Photograph of some pop-eyed peasant, I bet. What do you suppose EB stands for, see? Yeah? Hmm? A small union jack with EB stamped on it. Eat British? Is that all? <laughs> no, it's a picture of a woman with long hair. Hmm. I say, she's a beauty. Hmm. What's she doing in a trashy locket with a Union Jack? That's just what I was wondering. It's odd. I think I'll keep it. What a snooper you are. I find an old locket and you sent a mystery. Come on, let's go and get some lunch. I'm famished. Georgia, we have a visitor. I heard. You go. I'm busy. I'm... I'm all right. Evening. Uh, Keston's the name. Major Keston. A farmhouse over the hill. Took the liberty of calling. See how you'd settled in. Well, please come in, Major. Ah, thank you. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> this way. Mm -hmm. Ah, snug little billet, this. <laughs> How does the uh, mem like country life? Mem? Oh, Georgia. Oh, yeah, very much. Uh, she'll be down shortly. Uh, drink. Uh, thank you. No, I never touch it. <laughs> Ought to have called before. Uh, tell the truth, I was a bit scared. <laughs> Your mem being a famous explorer and so on, wouldn't expect her to have much time for simple village folk like us. <laughs> I don't think you'll find her very terrifying. Nigel, who's... Uh, ah, Georgia, this is Major Keston. Ah, how do you do? Major Keston, of course. I'm so glad you looked in, Major. We've heard so much about you in the village. <laughs> really? Nothing bad, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> 
I say, I hope you don't mind my mentioning it, Strangeways, but that's quite a lot of money to leave lying on your desk. There have been quite a few burglaries around here lately. Well, thanks for the tip, but I don't think it would pay any burglar to have a stab at us. My wife is a first-class revolver shot. <laughs> yes, I have shot one or two people. In self-defence, of course. Uh, and I suppose you're quite handy with a gun, too, eh? Have to be in your job, arresting murderers and so forth. <laughs> oh, no, no. I'm, I'm terrified of firearms. How very odd. Why, bless my soul. What's the matter, Major? There, on the desk. It's my locket. Wherever did you find it? I lost it last spring. Your locket? But... A bird. I beg your pardon? That's what it must have been, a damned magpie. Stole the locket, you mean? Exactly. A lot of the brutes over my way. A magpie. Must have been. Where on earth did you find it? It was in our hedge. There was only an old photograph in it. Yes. Uh, my mother, as a matter of fact. Really? We were very taken with her. I suppose she was quite young when it was done. Uh, yes, I believe so. Uh, must have been. Well, you better take it, Major. Do you mind if I have one more look at her? Oh, not at all. Thank you. Yes, she really was a beauty. Oh, oh dear, how clumsy of me. Oh, I'll just wipe off the dust with my handkerchief. There you are, Major. Good as new. Oh, thank you. Well, I mustn't keep you any longer. Oh, must you go? Afraid so, dear lady. Then let me see you out. You really must call again when you have more time. Sir, I should like to very much. Goodbye. Bye. And just why did you give that sickening display of ingenuousness, dear lady? And why did you deliberately drop the Major's mother in the coal scuttle? I didn't want him to notice that you'd opened up the back and see the EB thing, so I rubbed coal dust round the rim. And anyway, it couldn't possibly be his mother. Well, why not? Because that hairstyle went out too long ago. A well, fancy dress, perhaps? Hmm. A wig? No. No. But if it wasn't his mother, why was he so pleased to get the locket back? <laughs> perhaps the Union Jack and the E.B. is the important thing. Hmm. I don't like Major Keston, and what's more, he's by no means the fool he'd like us to think him. Blackmail. You know, Georgia, I think I shall have to inquire a little further into these curious goings-on. Oh, Nigel, must you? <laughs> it won't affect you. Your job was over when you spotted the date of those ringlets. I wish I could believe that. I, I think we'll pop down to the Green Lion tomorrow evening. If we go early enough, we might find mine host alone. I hear you had a visit from the Major, Mr. Strangeways. <laughs> you certainly travels fast in this village. <laughs> He's pretty popular in the district, I understand, Harry. Well, sir, he is and he isn't. He's well in with the farmers and with the gentry. <laughs> but, well, fact is, he's too bossy. Wants to rule the roost. Lots of folks don't like that. Mind you, his family used to be the squires here at Fullerton at one time. Oh. Ah, I didn't know that. I thought he was a newcomer. Well, he is and he is. Uh, the Kestons haven't lived here for two generations, and Fullerton House has been empty of late. So what I want to know is... Why didn't he take Fullerton House when he came home from India in 34? Perhaps he couldn't afford it. Ah, but he must have spent thousands rebuilding the farmhouse. And he brought in a lot of foreigners from London. I shouldn't have no shop with them. Good workers, though. Wonderful workshops they build up there. Workshops? We must walk over and have a look. Don't go at night, then. Why not? Because of the ghost. <laughs> <laughs> you may laugh, sir, but none of us will go past the Arnold Cross at night. Isn't that right, Joe? Uh, what's that? The ghost. Oh, she's right enough. Mm. I seen her. Churning butter for me. There was a dairy maid at Yarn Old Farm. Her started making eyes at the farmer. So the farmer's wife took a steak and sharpened it yeah. and stuck it in the maid's eyes. Oh. Maid rushes out the house, fell down a well. Yeah, terrible. Has anyone seen the ghost recently? Young Henry, too. He was courting, went up the cross one night. That was after the Major came. Mind you, young Henry is a bit simple. I mind the time he went to the doctor's oh, one day. Oh, dear, we're in for it now. <laughs> Keston! India! I've got it! Oh, oh. The connection, I knew I'd heard the name before. There was some sort of scandal... 
Heston, that's right. He ordered his men to open fire on a crowd. Several women were killed. Good Lord. He was told privately that he'd better resign. Anyway... Shh, shh, shh. Someone's coming. Walking towards the Arnold farm. Let's just step into these bushes and let them go by. This will do. Quietly now. For possible if I did anything with me. I shouldn't have thought the Major would have much time for trams. There's something fishy about them. For one thing, they seem to know exactly where they're going. For another, they're not slouching. Too upright, too... Military? Exactly. All right, so they aren't bona fide tramps. What now? I haven't the foggiest. What do you say to another walk after dinner? Oh, Nigel, must we? What a beautiful night. Mm. So quiet. I wonder... Really, Nigel, this is quite absurd. What came ye out for to see? A retired major whom, on the strength of an old locket and a couple of dubious tramps, we suspect of what? I'm afraid you're not taking this seriously. Taking what seriously? If you ask me, the whole thing is... <laughs> What's that? Come on, run, run, run. It. I... Lass, what a fool I am. The crossroads is the perfect spot to place a sentry in with a ghost story to back it up. Well, it shows they've got some fun and games going on. You showed great presence of mind, screaming like that. Uh, yes, yes, didn't I? <laughs> I took their mistake us for a courting couple and think they've scared us off. <laughs> well, what now? Well, I suggest we make a detour, go across country and hide in the wood overlooking the farm. That's a good idea. If there is something on going on, we might catch a glimpse of it. Mm. This is as near as we can get without being seen. What are they up to? Can you see anything? Mm, it, it's a gang of men unloading that lorry. Tramps. They're all tramps. Very well disciplined tramps from the way they're going about their business. Those boxes, I've seen. Something similar before. Well, it seems you were right after all. There is something fishy going on. Very fishy indeed. So what do we do now? Nothing. We go back the way we came, and tomorrow we arrange to go up to London and consult Uncle John. <whistles> Scotland Yard? You think it's that important? Yes, Georgia. Yes, I do. <laughs> And now, perhaps you two clams will open up. Nigel has hardly said a word since he rang you last night, Uncle John. Secrets, secrets. <coughs> well, are you going to tell me or not? No, wait. I'll just see that there isn't a masked man outside the door with his ear clamped to the keyhole. Good day, Mum. Ah! There, there is a man there. One of my men, as a matter of fact. It's that important. Anyway, I know what all this is about. Long, narrow cases, you said, Nigel, and heavy. Very heavy. Smuggling. I think they're smuggling. Uh, smuggling what? Oh, what do people smuggle? Brandy? Dope? Why not machine guns? Machine guns will do. You're not serious. No? Do you remember the Cagular in France, Nigel? The Hooded Men, yes. It was a conspiracy to overthrow the popular front government and set up a fascist dictatorship. Arms dumps were discovered in Paris and other cities. Mm, it nearly came off, too. None of your comic opera plots. But you're not suggesting... Not in England. Have either of you ever heard of the English banner? E.B. English banner? I see E.B., the E.B., printed on the flag in the locket. Exactly. Well, now, this English banner is a queer sort of society that flourishes mainly in the country districts. They believe in the natural aristocracy of the landowning classes. They're, well, they're, they're quite harmless. But if they're harmless, why... You would just consider. If you wanted a good cover for a dangerous organisation, what better than a harmless one? Which brings us to your military friend. Keston is a man with a grudge and considerable organising ability. As you know, he was politely sacked from the Indian police. He's just the kind of material the big people in this movement can use. But have you any evidence for connecting... Them? Oh, yes. The really interesting thing is that disc you found in the locket. 
You see, we've got one or two people inside English Banner, and I asked them about it after Nigel telephoned me last night. They report that there is no such membership token, and that means the discs are only in use amongst the inner circle of the movement. It all sounds absolutely melodramatic to me. Conspiracies are melodramatic, Georgia. Well, I'm worried to death about this. I don't mind saying so. Well, I can't believe it. What proof have you got that Major Keston is smuggling arms? Nigel. The tramps gave me the clue. Why tramps and why on foot? Why not just roll up to the farm in cars? No. It seemed to me that the only reason why people should disguise themselves and plod all the way to Yarnall Farm is that they were local bigwigs who couldn't afford to be recognised. Then the shape and size of those boxes left me in no doubt. But why couldn't the Major just invite them to dinner, all open and above board? Or if they didn't want to be recognised, why not just bring in a gang of weightlifters from uh, somewhere else? It's not easy to import strangers into a remote spot without rousing talk. Major Keston had done it once, remember, when he was improving the farm, and I'll bet one of those improvements was a cosy underground ammunition chamber. You see, Yarnold Farm was chosen for its strategic position. A cargo of arms could easily be landed at sea, say, at Catole Cove, and then transferred to the Majors and unloaded under the cover of darkness. Then why not get together a posse and burst into the Major's cellars? Uh, no, no. Derald put on their guard yet. Just stop them landing any more arms for the present. And how do you hope to do that? I've already done it. Tipped off Jimmy Blair. He'll write up the Arnold Cross Ghost for the daily papers and that'll bring hordes of sightseers and psychic researchers to the farm. <laughs> the Major will have to suspend operations till it blows over. Very clever. Our main problem is to try and find out who the real leader of the movement is. And to do that, we, uh, well, we want you to take a hand, my dear. Me? <laughs> but I did Why not Nigel? You're the only one of us, apart from Nigel, who has seen the picture in that locket. And that picture is our sole clue. You have the entree to fashionable society, and it is there we have to look for the centre of the movement. Also, I'll be frank with you, you are a bit of a legend in the country. Therefore, this movement will be glad to make use of you. And equally, you will be excellent propaganda against it when the time comes for a showdown. <clears throat> Conspiracy foiled by famous woman explorer, that sort of thing. The reason why Nigel has to keep out of this is obvious. He's my nephew, and his connection with the police is well known. <laughs> they never trust Nigel. But surely that applies to me. I am married to Nigel. Uh, <clears throat> yes. My dear, the idea is that you should not be married to Nigel. What? Simply arrange a separation. Not a legal one, of course. Just drop a hint to the gossip writers. They'll do the rest. Uh, have I got this right, Uncle John? You have the almighty nerve to suggest that I should separate from Nigel, create a scandal and go off on some wild goose chase after some individual who probably doesn't even exist. You're asking too much. Uh, Nigel, why don't you say something? You've cooked this up between you. You're asking me to... I'm asking you to do it for England. I should take it on if I were you. It wouldn't be for long. Regard it as another expedition. Oh! Why did this have to happen just as I was settling down to a nice, comfortable old age? It's worth doing, you know. Not just the person to do it. Oh! Oh! When do I start? Good girl. <laughs> now, I suppose the first thing to do is to stage manage our separation. We shall have to work out every move, every sordid letter and business item, as though it were the real thing. That's the part I don't like. However, if it has to be done, then, then I suggest you have the cottage and I'll move into the London flat. <laughs> I suppose we must hold the newspapers. Mm. Essential, I'm afraid. <laughs> Famous explorer, Pan's domesticity, that sort of thing. <laughs> I'll put you in touch with Alison Grove of the Daily Post. She's a good sort. <laughs> Meanwhile, you'll have to be coached carefully. Thoroughness and patience. They're the things that really matter in this sort of work. Read all about it. Woman explorer in divorce scandal. Read all about it. Alison, as punctual as ever and looking marvellous. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. Are you ready to go? I don't want to be late. Where are we off to tonight? Oh, a sort of country club, tray snob. Tell me, do you really enjoy all these parties you go to? But of course. You see, I'm an indoor girl at heart. And besides, think of all the pickings for my column. I'm the butterfly that's stamped. Stamped on what? On all the other butterflies, of course. Now, do come along, dear. <laughs> Oh, wow.
it's hot in here. It's like a cauldron. It's unhealthy. Hush, my dear. A dark lady is coming into your life. I'm so glad you could come, Miss Grove. <laughs> Madame Alvarez is our hostess, my friend Mrs. Strangeways. Ah, delighted. How do you do? Allow me to present my husband, Don Alvarez. You will find some very interesting people here tonight, ladies. I hope you like our little place, Mrs. Strangeways. Indeed. But it is rather hot. Oh, my husband feels the cold so horribly. He is not used to our climate yet. Well, enjoy yourselves. <laughs> Who on earth is that preposterous marionette? The husband of the owner. Well, that's the story at any rate. What do you think of Madame? Seville and Surbiton. <laughs> she looks somewhat discontented in spite of the grand manner. So would you if you were married to the oldest tortoise in the zoo. <laughs> However, we all have our consolations. Perhaps Peter Braithwaite will be here tonight. He's a cricketer, you know, the England batsman. Cricket? Oh, yes. Well, it takes all sorts. You'll like him. Come on, let's go and eat. You know, there's something odd about this place. It, it doesn't ring true. Mm. I know what you mean. Still, nothing amiss with the food. Mm. Mm. Ah, there's Peter. Peter, darling. Oh, uh, Alison, mm. see you later. Rather tied up at present. Oh. <laughs> mm. Rather dashing. Mm. Yes, isn't he? He's certainly alive, which is more than I can say for most of the others. Oh, Madame Alvarez seems to think so, too. <laughs> what on earth can he see in her? He's positively goggling. Who knows? Perhaps he's just being kind to her. Perhaps. Well, what now? Bridge, I think. After that, well, as soon as we decently can, we'll slip away. Thank God to be in the fresh air again. Alison. I said, oh, Alison. Sorry we didn't get a chance to talk, Peter. Uh, this is Mrs. Strangeways. You were obviously far too busy. Uh, yes. No luck yet, Alison. And what did you expect? You're far too young. Uh, it's good for you, <laughs> Mrs. Strangeways. Well, you've had a look at the bowling. What do you think? Bowling? What on earth? Uh, quite a good actor, uh, Peter. Positively goggling, I think you said. But do you mean you're not in love with that creature? <laughs> then why? Well, you'd better ask Sir John Strangeways about that. Uncle John? It's all right, Georgia. No need to worry. You see, Peter and I are both working for him, too. Well, I'm... <laughs> You dissembling little cat. <laughs> and you think that this club is... It's being used by people behind the EB movement, yes. Ah. And I think it's time we took the offensive. I've managed to find out there's a secret room where they have meetings of some kind. Ah. It's supposed to be a gambling den, but I'm not so sure. Anyway, something's due to happen next Thursday, and I suggest that we gate crash. Might be as well if we had another chap on hand, just in case things turn nasty. Yeah. Mm, good idea. I know, I'll rope in cousin Rudolph. Rudolph Cavendish. The MP. Mm, that's the one. He'd be an excellent witness if things do get out of hand. Cavendish! I say, Cavendish! Oh, stand by, I think the fun's about to begin. You are Cavendish, aren't you? Yes, old man. Yeah, wonderful memory for faces. Well, I'm going to tell you something, Cavendish. More to this club than meets the eye. I say, steady on. Oh, yes, there is, yeah. Things go on here as you scarcely believe. Uh, news to me. Georgia, I might all right, Mrs. Strangeways. <laughs> Just telling Cavendish here. Don't mind people having a little flutter. <laughs> live and let live, I say. But I, I, resent, I bitterly resent this hole-in-the-corner business. I mean, if I want to gamble, my money's as good as anyone else's. Of course it is, old man. Now, come and sit down. There's a good You may be an MP, Cavendish, but you're a rotten bad listener. Now, Madame Alvarez told me they play roulette here. Point is, why is any Tom, Dick or Harry allowed to play, but not me? Hmm? But I'm damn well going to play. And what's more, I'm going to do it now. Now, look here, you're upsetting the ladies. Leave I... me alone. All right. I'll hit you for six. For heaven's sake, Peter, everyone's staring at us. Let them. Leave him to me. I think I can manage him. Come along, Peter, I want to see the fun. Good for you. A lot of stuffed shirts. Follow me, I'm in the way. I'm so sorry. Poor chap. A bit pickled. What the... 
Ah, Isabella. I'm terribly sorry, <laughs> madame. Mr. Braithwaite is a little above himself. Peter, come away. I'm sure madame Alvarez is busy. Oh. Never too busy to see me, eh, hey, ducky? <laughs> I want to play roulette. Peter, please, you mustn't. I want to play roulette. There is no game tonight. Mrs. Strangeways, can't you do uh, something? Look. Press this little button on the wall and no. open sesame. Oh. Oh. There! What did I tell you? Roulette! Bloody roulette! He's drunk, how beastly! What is the meaning of this intrusion? Naughty, naughty! A gambling den. Well, I promise not to tell the police if you let me play. This is a private party, senor. These are all friends of mine. Now, sir. Will you leave, or must we use force? I do apologise, senor. Please forgive Mr Braithwaite. He had a little too much to drink downstairs, I'm afraid. Please, do not apologise, madame. Oh. It is I who should do so for my seeming inhospitality. But you realise that my guests... Come along, Peter. I'm sure senor Alvarez will allow you to play some other time. But I want to play tonight. Peter, come along. Oh, all right. I wonder what Sir John Strangeways would think of this, Mrs Strangeways. Professor Steele, isn't it? Officially, he'd disapprove, no doubt. I do hope that we do not have a police spy in our midst. What the devil oh, do you mean? Oh, I won't tell on you. As a matter of fact, I shan't be seeing much of Sir John now. Oh, then you really have left your husband. It's not just a publicity stunt. I hardly think that the ubiquitous Professor Steele is quite the right person to make charges of publicity, Sir <laughs> Madam, as one victim of the press to another... I offer you my humble apologies. <laughs> Come along, Peter. It's time we went. Well, there it is. Talk about a wild goose chase. All that trouble for nothing. Not for nothing, Peter. Come on. Out with it, Georgia. What happened up there? Well, for one thing, did you notice, Peter, that when we went in, all the heads were turned towards the door? Well, they've been warned. Madame rang the bell under her desk, announcing that some rough fellows were going to burst in on their roulette. But don't you see? If it had been just a roulette game, the only point of the bell would have been to warn them to hide any evidence of an illicit game. But they didn't. They didn't hide anything. They wanted us to believe they'd been playing all the time. But they made the mistake of looking up when the door opened. You mean real gamblers would have been far too absorbed mm. in the game to pay any attention to a door opening? Exactly, and the ball was still rolling. So you see, Peter, that game must have been bogus. By Jove, Georgia, you're right. You're absolutely right. Oswald! Oswald, down, boy, down! <laughs> it's quite all right. I like dogs. <laughs> Why, it's Mrs. Strangeways, isn't it? I'm Celia Mayfield? Yes, of course. How clever of Oswald to find you here. <laughs> Do you live in London? No, uh, just up for a few days. Uh, my father has a place in Berkshire. He trains racehorses. Oh, that must be fun. Horses to ride and the downs wide open before you. Oh, it's all right, I suppose. I get bored, though. It's all very well for you. I mean, you can go exploring. You're as free as air. <laughs> I want to do things, but Daddy... Oh, well, you know what fathers are like. Mm. He'd like me to ride side saddle and sit at home in the evenings with a good book. He uh, wouldn't approve of roulette, I take it. Glory, no. He'd go up in smoke. I say, you, you won't let on. No, don't worry. Do you play much? It's the excitement. Excitement? Watching a little ball twiddling round? Maybe there's more adventure in it than you think. Well, if it's adventure and excitement you're looking for, perhaps you ought to try Nazi Germany. Things seem to be happening there, all right. It's wonderful. I've never been there, but I can imagine it all. The spirit of youth and confidence and so on. Sometimes I wish we had something like that in England. Not fascism, of course, but something like it. Adapted to our national character. Get rid of all those old doddering politicians. Mm. Yes, I quite agree. We've given democracy a fair trial and it's let us all down. Let the best people rule. I say, you're not a member of English banner, are you? English banner? What's that? Oh, it's just something I belong to. You'd rather like it. Tell you what, why don't you come and stay with us in Berkshire? Then you could come to a local meeting of the banner. It's just your sort of thing. All right, I will. Good for you. 
Now, when will be the best time for you to pay us a visit? Hello? Georgia, thank God you're home. Look, can you come round to my lodgings right away? Why? What's happened? It's Madame Alvarez. She's turned up here. She's in an awful state. I, I, I just don't know what to do. See, I, I've got to go out and... I'll come now. Oh, bless you. It's Feltham Court, St John's Wood. Mm -hmm. I'll take a taxi. Be there as soon as I can. Peace. Oh, thank God you're here. I've calmed her down a bit. When she got here, she was almost hysterical. Problem is, I'm due at Lord's at ten. Can you, can you hold the fort for a bit? Mm. I couldn't get hold of Alison. And I... Off you go. Leave Madame A to me. Oh, Georgia, you're a brick. So long. Bye. Are you feeling any better, madame? Would you like me to get you a doctor? Oh, no, no doctors. I'm not going back. Never. Don't let them take me back. Please, don't excite yourself. You're quite safe here. Oh, you don't know them. My husband, he was so angry. He will hurt me. He locked me in my room, but I escaped. He was angry because I let Peter into the roulette room. He frightens me. Surely he'd never hurt you just because you were a little indiscreet about the roulette room. Are you sure he's not jealous about... Well, about you and Peter. Oh, no, it's not that, I swear. Well, it must be something else. Some secret, perhaps? I don't understand. He just said no one must go into that room while they were playing, and I tried to stop Peter. I did. No. Oh, oh. I'm so sorry, ma'am. I told oh. them, Mr Braithwaite, was out, but they just... Why, whatever. No. My dear, you gave me such a fright oh. going off like that. <laughs> Luckily, I found Mr Braithwaite's address in your book. <laughs> Now, you must come home at once and go to bed. Uh, we'll send for your doctor. Uh, Charles. James. Help, madame. No. Swear, no. Madame. No. Me, madame. Uh, uh, no. Is everything all right, man? Yes, no. thank you. The, the lady has been taken ill, that's all. If you say so, ma'am. I won't be far away if you need me. Mm. Senor Alvarez, if you leave your wife with me, I assure you she will be in good hands. I am sure of it, madame. But I could not think of putting you to so much trouble. Oh. Uh, you will understand when I tell you that my wife suffers from recurrent delusions, a form of persecution mania. Uh, at such times she has to be confined. Expert medical attention is needed. Mm. Now... If it will set your mind at rest, please accompany her home with us and speak to her doctor. Believe me, I realize just how distressing this must be for you. I wonder if you do. Very well, I agree. She must go home at once. But I will come with you and I will speak to her doctor. You look awful. What's happened? Oh, Georgia, it's such a dirty game. It's Madame Alvarez. She's dead. Dead? It was only a week ago she came to me. I couldn't raise a finger to help her. But how did it happen? I was afraid they'd do it. I should have done something to stop them. You can't mean they killed her. But I saw her safely home and spoke to her doctor. Uncle John assured me that his credentials were impeccable. All the same, he's one of them, I'm sure of it. What did she die of? Oh, some obscure disease. Oh, it was all above board, proper death certificate and so on. They even called in a specialist. Oh, they moved with the times these chaps were up against. Nothing so old-fashioned as blunt instruments. Just a neat little dose of microbes. Peter, tell me, who was this specialist? Can't you guess? Professor Hargreaves Steele. The tropical disease man? But he's one of the... Mm. My God! Exactly. I tell you, Georgia, you've got to watch your step where the English banner are concerned. Do please be careful in Berkshire. Don't worry, Peter. I mean to be. Good morning, Celia. Have you brought the good news from Ghent to Aix? I, I've had a lovely ride. Did you see me up on the hill? Good boy. Tommy, look after Banner, will you? All right, old mess. Come on. Don't the planes upset your horses? Oh, they've got used to them. We've got three aerodromes within a radius of 20 miles or so. We've all got used to them, I suppose. Used to the air being the element of death. I say, you're not a pacifist, are you? No. I just dislike the idea of being killed without having a chance to hit back. I wanted to join the Civil Air Guard. But Daddy wouldn't let me. He thinks flying isn't womanly. Hm. You should tell him to read Metalink's Life of the Bee. 
Daddy, read a book. That's a laugh. Tell me, what did you think of the meeting last night? Uh, do you want me to be polite or honest? I hate people being polite. Very well, then. I thought it was a ridiculous piece of hocus-pocus. Oh. Uh, not the idea itself. I wouldn't have joined if I thought that. But really, all that talk, peevish and feeble. Why did they do something instead of whining all the time? Haven't they any guts? Your brothers look as if they have, but they just jabbered away with the rest. We're not quite so feeble as you think. We're helping to get things done. Really? Writing to the Times or what? What would you say if I told you that in less than a year's time we'll have swept away the Democrats in Britain and set up a real leadership and a real leader? I'd say you were dreaming. Not at all. A real leader. Do you know his name? I shouldn't be allowed to tell you even if I knew. Very few people in the movement know his name. Then how do you know he's any good? He's planned the whole thing. That's how we can tell. The organisation is simply amazing. Oh, yes? The whole country is divided into six districts, each with its own organiser. Mm. Then each district is divided into sections and subsections. The inner council. Oh. Oh, but uh, perhaps I'm saying too much. No, it, it's very interesting. Would you come in? Our inner council thinks you'd be invaluable. You bet I'd come in if I thought you had any chance of success. But tell me, did they ask you to approach me or was it your own idea? After all, I'd have thought they'd be rather suspicious of me. I did marry into the police, so to speak. I wouldn't have approached you unless I'd been told to. The movement doesn't encourage its members to be indiscreet. Believe me, you've been thoroughly investigated already. Have I really? And what the devil do you mean by... Oh, I <laughs> beg your pardon, Mrs Strangeways. Uh, didn't see you. Uh, devilish hot today. Yes, isn't it? I'm sorry, Daddy. I, I didn't realise you were busy. Uh, we'll come back later. Yes, please. I didn't realise your father was an author. An author? Whatever makes you think that. I told you he only ever reads the form book. Oh, I thought he was busy going through a proof copy. Oh, that. I expect some publisher sent it to him for an opinion. Some racing memoir or other. How interesting. By the way, I forgot to tell you. We've a rather special guest for dinner. Oh? Chili's coming. Chili? <laughs> Lord Chiltern Cantelo. Daddy trains his horses. The sporting millionaire. I'm impressed. You will be when you meet him. He's a grand chap. I shall look forward to it. Well, this is nice, Mrs. Strangeways. I've heard so much about you. Indeed. And I about you, Lord Cantelow. We have something in common, I believe. Oh? What can that be, I wonder? We both like taking risks. Taking risks? I thought you'd retired from active service. Are you planning another expedition? Oh, well, no. It's so exciting in England at the moment, isn't it? Exciting? Yes. I feel we're on the edge of great events. The stay-at-homes will see the fun this time. <laughs> My goodness. You sound as if you were going to start a revolution or something. <laughs> Yes. Yes, I think you'd make a splendid Joan of Arc. <laughs> well, if I do start a revolution, you'll have to finance it. <laughs> but, seriously, with all this international tension, something's bound to break soon. Uh, tell me, what's the feeling in Germany now? I haven't been there recently. Oh, they're scared, like us. Only they shout a good deal louder to hide it. I say, Chili, we're all going over to Hartgrove tomorrow to see the big air show. There are going to be some bombers on show. And Wildy's giving a display of aerobatics. Oh, young Gerald. Well, what do you say, Mrs. Strangeways? Why not? It should be fun. Oh, that's better. Now, where is that proof? Oh, here it is. Fifty years on the turf, to be published September the 5th. Hmm, it's a long time before publication. Let me see. Nothing here, not a mark, not a clue. Damn, September the 5th. Try page five. Nothing. Page nine. Hmm, nothing here either. September, ninth month. Nine fives, 45. Eureka! Marked letters. I knew there was something fishy going on. Now, W I will D will D dangerous dangerous a uh, uh, range accident. Will D. My God, 
that young wild man. The young stunt pilot. I must warn him. Oh, but, but if I do, they'll know I've been spying on them. But if I don't, what shall I do? Hang on, though. This has all been just a bit too convenient, a bit too neat. A chap who seldom reads anything but the form book, correcting proofs, and those same proofs, complete with secret message, left about for anybody to find. All the same. Suppose Wildman's life is in danger. I wonder. Well, my dear, nobody said it was going to be easy. Georgia, my dear, we thought we'd lost you. Come and meet one of the stars of the show. General Wildman, Mrs. Strangeways. How do you do? Yours is a pretty dangerous job. Oh, I don't know. One gets used to it. I feel a lot safer in a plane than I would trekking up the Amazon. <laughs> uh, but if you'll excuse me, I must go and earn my keep. Mr. Wildman? Yes? Uh, good luck. Thanks. Now, come along, everybody. We'll watch this from the main stand. I'm looking forward to this. So am I. I do hope nothing happens to him. Why should anything happen to him? Well, stunt flying is dangerous. Don't worry. Wildy knows what he's doing. He really is very good. Isn't he? It must be wonderful to fly like that. He's still climbing. It's his best stunt. Watch this. He's diving. Oh! oh. He's cutting it a bit fine, isn't he? He'll never do it. Oh, God. Now watch. Well, that's all right, then. Yes. I'm very glad. So am I, my dear. So am I. Two white ladies, madam. Mm, thank you. Oh, Alison, it is nice to see an ally again. Same here. How are Nigel and Uncle John? Well, Nigel's still at your cottage, and Sir John is very worried about this EB business. He won't be when he sees my report. So you haven't been wasting your time in Berkshire. Are you going back there? No. Chili's asked me to stay at his place. Chili? Lord Cantalope. Well, you haven't wasted any time on nickname terms with a noble lord already. Not only that, my dear, I'm pretty sure that he's our man. What? Oh, no, that's too much. Why, he's got everything. Money, power, popularity. Oh, he'd never risk all that, especially now. Now? Haven't you seen tonight's papers? Millionaire plans millennium, a new nationwide plan for the abolition of unemployment in Britain. Good Lord! Well, it's a scheme on a heroic scale. It's brilliant. He's putting up a million of his own money to get it started. Why, he's the most popular man in Britain at this moment. And, therefore, the perfect man to seize power when the EB take over. Mm. It's odd his coming out into the open like this, just as I've begun to get proof that he's the man behind the English banner. Don't flatter yourself, my dear. You're just a nice little woman to him. <laughs> or perhaps a nasty little nuisance, depending on how much he suspects me. Mm. Do you know that when Wildman was doing his stunt, Chili's eyes were on me the whole time? Oh, Alison, it was awful. I had to gamble with his life for fear of being discovered, and all the time Cantalo was watching me, just waiting for me to warn him and give myself away. It was all a plant, you see. Oh, but there's something else, and this is why I'm sure that Lord Cantalo is our man. Would you like another drink? Oh, Georgia, tell me. Well... After the air display, there was a party, games, charades, all that sort of thing. You know how the English love dressing up. Ooh. Well, I pretended to go to bed early. I hoped they might be off their guard if they thought I was out of the way. Later, I sneaked downstairs again. They'd all had quite a bit to drink by that time, so nobody paid any attention to But me. what has this got... Shh, I'm telling you. After about an hour, I decided to go to my room. On the way back, I happened to glance into the dressing room where they were getting ready for another game. Yes. Well, in the mirror, I caught a glimpse of chilli, and I almost fainted on the spot. He was wearing a black wig, parted in the middle, and with long ringlets uh, falling to his shoulders. <laughs> that would have had me swooning with laughter. Yes, except that the face I saw in the mirror was the face of the woman in Major Keston's locket. Georgia, welcome to Chilton Ashwell. Do you want some tea? No, thanks. I've already had some. 
I think your house is perfect. But why are you all in white? Have you been Morris dancing? Morris dancing? Oh, <laughs> what a tortuous mind you have. We've been playing cricket. Oh. It's all one to Mrs. Strangeways. She doesn't know the difference. Hello, Georgia. How was London? Hot and frantic as usual. But tell me, Peter, what are you doing here? Have they thrown you out of your county side? <laughs> no, we've no fixture today. So Lord Canslow asked me to play for his team against one of the local sides. Oh. They're holy terrors. Yes, we don't dope the wicked here. Shows you chaps up when you've got to play on an honest piece of turf. <laughs> uh, now, if you'll excuse me, there are one or two matters of a domestic nature which I must attend to. Perhaps you would care to instruct Georgia on the laws of cricket while I'm gone, Peter. <laughs> I don't think so, but I will challenge her to a round of clock golf. Excellent. I can't play clock golf. That's all right, I'll teach you. Oh, damn, I've missed again. I'll <laughs> never get the hang of it. Did you really come here just to play cricket? Not entirely. Alison, let me know you've begun to play the big fish. Were you surprised? Blast! <laughs> missed again! After all the things we've come across recently, I shouldn't be surprised to learn that Lord Cantalow was ready the Dalai Lama. No, you're not doing it properly. It's, it's all these horrid bumps on the grass. I thought clock golf was played on a level surface. It is. His lordship laid this out himself. Probably wanted to make it more difficult. He's a great games player, our host. And what's more, he seems to have taken a fancy to you. Either that or he's become suspicious. Oh, do be careful. I can't help thinking of poor Madame Alvarez. Peter, are you any good at riddles? Riddles? When is a clock not a clock? Beats me. When it's a map. Now, I'm going to throw my club on the ground in disgust, just in case we're being watched. I'll bet we are. Now, you keep playing. Go round again slowly while I sit here on the grass and watch. I want to study the layout carefully. Yeah, what's all this about, Georgia? Well, I've an idea that this course represents a map of England. If I'm right, the position of the holes and starting numbers will tell us something. Good Lord, you're not suggesting Cantalow would lay out a map right under everyone's nose. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But then he is a touch crazy, isn't he? Well, Georgia, how did the golf go? It was awful. I gave up in disgust. <laughs> you should have tried Morris dancing. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? How am I looking at you? As if I was a new kind of equation your teacher had chalked up on the blackboard. Perhaps you are. I can't quite place you. Do you always have to place people? When they might be dangerous to me, yes. <laughs> How could I possibly be dangerous to you? If you don't know, nobody does. <laughs> this is a very odd conversation, considering we've only met once before. Well, neither of us ordinary people. Do you suppose we should talk about the weather? It's a safe topic, especially when you're dealing with a dangerous person. <laughs> I don't play for safety. Neither do you, by all accounts. No, oh, there's not much risk for a traveller these days. Travelling? Oh, yes. But uh, where are we talking about travel? Georgia, have you any idea what an electrifying creature you are? Why, with a woman like you, one Oh, Chilly, there you are. I've been looking for you everywhere. I need your advice. Damn. My dear professor, how can I help you? Well, and what news on the EB front this morning? Peter, I was right. The golf course is a map of England. I've been comparing it with an atlas in my room. And what's more, the even numbers fall in county districts. Taking the location of Major Keston's house as one, I reckon the other five are also arms dumps. Good Lord. Celia Mayfield said they had divided the country into six districts. The centre hole is obviously Nottingham. Isn't there a huge arms factory there? Nottingham, that's odd. The trouble is, it's all too vague. I must get more information before I pass it on to Uncle John and get it quickly. I've got a nasty feeling that things are hotting up. A riot here, an attempted assassination there, sudden unexplained panics on the stock exchange. All very carefully organised. It's all very disturbing. But how to get more proof, that's the problem. Mm. There's only one way that I can see. I'll have to burgle Cantalet's study. Oh, for God's sake, be careful, Georgia. How will you know where to look? You may have a foolproof safe. I already know where to look. Did you notice last night when we had pre-dinner drinks in the study, he kept touching that globe of the world thing? Oh, the terrestrial globe? Yeah, that's it. He seemed fascinated by it. Well, I'm sure that's the key. Like the golf course, out in the open, hide a tree in a forest, that sort of thing. Why odd? I'm sorry. I... When I mentioned Nottingham, you said that's odd. Oh, good Lord, I almost forgot. It's just that this morning before breakfast, I happened to overhear a telephone conversation. Mm -hmm. A chap named Goats is passing through tomorrow, and somebody's left an address for him. 
I remember it clearly. I thought it might be a bookmaker. Sam Silver. <laughs> 420 Eastwaite Street, Nottingham. It could be the EB's Nottingham headquarters. I'll pass it on to Uncle John at Scotland Yard. Then again, it could all be perfectly innocent. All the same, I've thought of a way to make sure. If I take off today, I could present myself at Mr. Sam Silver's house as ghosts. But suppose he's known there. No, otherwise why leave him the address? Yes, you're right. But it's damned risky. Oh, don't worry, I can take care of myself. Anyway, ours is a risky business. It's no more risky than breaking into his nib's study. Right. Don't be surprised if I disappear. I shall be very surprised, at least where Cantalet is concerned. Paper, paper, test cricketer missing. Read all about it. Paper, paper, Nottingham explosion, all the news, all the news. Georgia, do you have any idea where Peter's pushed off to? I only wish I knew. Hmm. You don't think he's got into some sort of trouble or had a brainstorm or something of a sort? <laughs> oh, no, that's not possible. He seemed perfectly normal when I last saw him. Still, it's not like him to go off and leave his team in the lurch. Georgia, his team happens to be England. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps he's been kidnapped. That's an idea. Kidnap Peter Braithwaite and sting the MCC for a whacking ransom. <laughs> oh, I can't see anyone getting much joy from the MCC. But, uh... <laughs> I ought not to joke about his sudden disappearance. I'm forgetting what a great friend of yours he is. Oh, I don't know him all that well. Although I have sometimes thought that there's rather more to him than just the cricket idol. I wonder... Oh, come now, my dear. If anyone gives the impression of leading a double life, it's you. What do you mean, sir? Well, <laughs> you're a woman in love with adventure, everyone knows that, and you have the ability and the means to gratify it. Instead of which... We find you trotting round dull country house parties. It's suspicious. Nothing odd about a provincial middle-aged woman slowing down. Oh, don't belittle yourself, my dear. It's not in character. Oh, by the way, I have a favour to ask of you. Mm -hmm. I have some people coming down tomorrow, the chief backers of the Chiltern Fund. Would you mind playing hostess for me? I should be honoured. Thank you. Uh, but remember, you must treat them nicely and... Keep a watch on that witty, outspoken tongue of yours. Oh, I wish I knew how far I could trust you. Trust me? You sound very serious of a sudden. Have you ever heard of the English banner? No. Uh, what is it? It's a society that believes in the principle of aristocracy and the rule and government of the superior person. <laughs> superior persons, indeed. Oh, my dear old thing, you're playing at medievalism. Surely you're not taken up with that sort of nonsense. Oh, I know the EB can sound a bit cranky and absurd, but do you think that the principle behind it is sound, that some men were born to rule the rest? I used to be all for democracy, but now, well, just look at the mess England is in. Georgia, have you turned fascist like Herr Hitler and his gang? I don't like their methods, but you must agree that they get things done. Mm, and the trains run on time. Now, what's all this leading up to, little Georgia? It could be leading up to a leader, a man who could be a great leader if he had the right organisation behind him. Well, supposing there was such an organisation, wouldn't it have chosen or wouldn't it choose its own leader? Mm, I don't know about that. All I do know is that the best man should and would get to the top. <laughs> well, good luck to him. No, I'm far too lazy for that sort of thing. I can't keep up with you and your voices, Madame Joan of Arc Strangeways. <laughs> You won't make me your dauphin of the storm, unless... Unless? Excuse me, my lord. Uh, yes, what is it, Rivers? The telephone for Mrs. Strangeways, my lord. It's the Daily Post, madam. Oh, dear. What can they want? And how on earth do they know I'm here? Excuse me while I get rid of them. But, of course. Hello? Hello, Georgia, it's Alison. Sorry to ring you there, but it's very bad news, I'm afraid. It's Peter. We thought you ought to know. Can you speak up, please? Can you be overheard? That's correct. Sorry to break it like this, but there's been an explosion in Nottingham, some sort of arms dump. Peter's dead. Georgia, are you there? Yes. Sir John Strangeways had announced that an IRA explosive store had blown up. You seem very sure of your information. There's no doubt, I'm afraid. Sir John's been in Nottingham with a team of experts. He has definite evidence of Peter's involvement. 
beat. He was due to pay in the tap. I'm sorry. Yes, I heard you quite clearly. Thank you. But there's absolutely no truth in the rumour that I'm planning another expedition. I have quite enough to do here in England. Take care, Georgia. Yes, thank you. Goodbye. How very interesting, Mr. Strangeways. I had no idea you were so well informed about tropical diseases. Travelling in the tropics, one can't help but take an interest, Professor Steele. You really must come and visit my laboratory. I should love to. But if you will excuse me, gentlemen, I'll leave you to your brandy and cigar. Oh, thank you, my dear. We do have some rather boring business to discuss, as it happens. We'll join you later. Not too much later, I hope. Oh, believe me, we could never be so ungallant. <laughs> and now for that damn globe. Hmm. Seems to be all of a piece, all the same. Perhaps it's on the join. Hmm, that's no good. It's too well made. Oh, catch on the frame? No, blast. Perhaps if I press. But where? England? The same as the golf course. Now. Eureka! I knew it! She put in her thumb <gasps> and pulled out a plum and said, What a bad girl am I? Wouldn't you like a little more light? You'll strain your eyes trying to read that. Oh, don't try yelling for help, or this gun might go off. And I shall have to explain that I thought you were a burglar and shot you by mistake. I shall have lots of witnesses. You little bitch. So it is you. I was sure that you must be our leader, but I had to prove it to myself. Come off it, Georgia. I know you're a spy. Oh, you lulled my suspicions for a while, I'll admit. It was clever of you not to warn Wilden at the air display, but... Hmm, I was never quite sure of you. That's why I kept you near me. Well, and what are you going to do with me? Hand me over to the police? Oh, dear, no. No, I'm afraid you've got yourself into hotter water than that. You'll have to be disposed of. What good will that do? Isn't it obvious? It's not obvious at all. Sir John Strangeways at Scotland Yard knows all about it. That silly picture in the locket was a mistake, and so was the clock golf course. Oh, yes, we know all about your arms, Dumps. Oh, what an infernal nuisance women are. The golf course. So that's how that meddling fool Braithwaite got onto us at Nottingham. He was responsible for the explosion there, you know. Several of our people died with him. Good for Peter. Pity. He was a fair bat on his day. Well, it's all no great trouble. I shall have to move the dumps, of course, but these things can always be managed. Yes, I know. Money talks. But there's one thing you lousy egotists with money forget. That this country is full of decent people who don't take bribes. <laughs> there are, however, quite enough who do take bribes. You'd be surprised, my dear. So what? Even supposing you start your revolution at all, a few innocents will be killed and then you'll collapse. Oh, you'll get away, no doubt. The rats always do manage to leave the sinking ship. You know, Georgia, you're really quite clever for a woman, but not clever enough. There is a world of difference between mere cleverness and genius. So, you think the English banner revolution is going to fail? I'm sure it is. You're quite right. I intend it to fail. That plan you're still hugging to your bosom, uh, you may read it before you die. We'll call that plan A, but there's another, a plan B. The trouble with you, Georgie, is that you lack subtlety. You've got a second-rate mind like that keyhole-peeping husband of yours. It's wonderful how unimpressive you are in the role of genius through the ages. <laughs> ah! You swine! You bloody swine! Oh, rest assured. The E.B. Rising will take place all right. Cabinet ministers will be assassinated. There'll be panic on the stock exchange. The civil service will be thrown into confusion. Broadcasting house will be occupied. The daily papers closed down. And while flights of bombers threaten Westminster, the government will be forced to hand over power to the English banner. And then... I shall intervene. I should perhaps add that my partners, my future partners in Germany, are awaiting the outcome of events with great interest. And should matters prove more difficult to manage than I expect... They're prepared to lend a hand. I see. So all you and your precious English banner amount to is a sort of fifth column. 
first to give your jack-booted friends an opportunity to attack England, and then to stab us in the back. You are contemptible. <laughs> Come along, little Georgia. It's time to go. I'm putting you in one of the upstairs rooms for a little while. Now, if you'll walk in front of me slowly and carefully. That's the way. In here, please. Ah. Oh. Light is working. So you'll be able to read. I'm afraid there are no sheets on the bed. It's just as well, perhaps. Dangerous girl like you might well make a rope of them and climb out of the window, like they do in schoolgirl books when there's a fire. <laughs> well, so long, my dear. You've had your little adventure, haven't you? As to your demise, I must consult Professor Steele. I don't know if he has any maggots with him. I'm sure he'll think of something. Shall we say, um, oh, half an hour? Give you time to read those plans. <laughs> you know... You're not such an efficient spy after all. Are you, my dear? Let me out! Let me out! Oh, that's no good. Oh, Nigel, if only we were doing this together. Keep cool, my dear. Now, what would Nigel do? Keep calm. Evaluate the situation. Right, first, the door. Hmm. Too solid. Chilton Ashwell was built to last. The lock. <clears throat> Strong. There's nothing to force it with anyway. Oh, Georgia, what to do? Cantalo was right, I'm afraid. I have had my adventure. <laughs> heroine in a schoolgirl book, indeed. Some heroine. Whenever there's a fire... Chilly, I can't force the door, so I'll burn it down. Now, let's see. Nail file, handkerchief, cigarettes, lighter. Thank God I'm a smoker. Now, notebook, what a burn. Notebook, yes. Plans, no. Ah, cupboard drawers are usually lined with paper. Eureka! Now, what else? Mattress block. Mm. <clears throat> Lovely. Now, <clears throat> let's see what we can do. <clears throat> let's pray it doesn't get out of hand. Fire extinguisher, just in case. Wait and see, my dear. I knew it. I thought I could smell smoke there. It's coming from under that door. Dad, they come too soon. Stand back, Professor, while I open the door. Careful now. <coughs> Where the devil is she? The smoke, I can't. She's here! What the devil is. Ah! Ah! My eyes! My eyes! Hello? Alison, it's me, Georgia. Oh, thank you. Guilty, I'm afraid. I'd have indulged in murder, too, if I'd had the sense. I only managed robbery. I stole his Rolls Royce in order to get away. <laughs> but listen, I've got Cantalet's plans. Two plans, really. Places, dates, everything. Oh, well done. The thing is, I can't seem to get in touch with Uncle John at Scotland Yard. Not surprising. He was knocked down by a car this morning. The EB worked quickly, it seems. My God, he's not... No, but in a critical condition, by all accounts. But tell me, where are you? Uh, Manchester. I drove to Chilton Station, booked to London, and later I changed trains. I've got a room in a quiet hotel, The Grange. Stay there. I'll arrange for someone to pick you up and escort you to London. All right. But if I do have to leave here for any reason, I'll try to get to Oxford and Nigel. Take care. 
Take care, Georgia, and don't trust anyone. Mm. Cantelow's got to get you now, otherwise it's all up with the English banner. I know. It's a rather chilling thought. Oh, Alison, you will let Nigel know I'm all right. Yes, of course. Remember now, stay where you are and we'll come and get you. Could I have my key, please? Room 43. Certainly, madam. Did your friends find you? I beg your pardon? Two young men were asking for you. They said they'd call back. Uh, there must be some mistake. They described you exactly. Um, excuse me, I've just remembered something important. But madam, your key. Oh, Georgia, you're on the run. What to do? I can't go back to the hotel. Damn. Alison's chap will have a wasted journey. I say, Mrs. Strange, wait. Just a moment. My God. They haven't wasted any time. I say, we'd like a word with you. What shall I do? A, de a department store, just the thing. They'll never kidnap me in the middle of a crowd of shoppers. Let's hope they're all men chasing me. They'll need to be made of stern stuff to follow me into the ladies. Excuse me, madam. The manager would like a word with you. The manager? I don't understand. He would like you to explain the presence of certain articles in your pockets. I'm afraid I don't understand. Please let go of my Better elbow. Better wash the dirty linen in private, madam. This way, please. Now then, Mrs... Uh... Smith. Uh, Mrs Percy Smith. I demand Would you, you mind know... emptying your pockets, please? I... Oh, very well. You know, this really is very naughty of you, Mrs. Percy Smith. Oh. Please don't distress yourself. <laughs> Hallam and Appleby never prosecute first offenders. Oh, but... That'll be all. Thank you, Smithers. Yes, Mr. Dickens. And now, Mrs. Strangeways, what can I do for you? No need to look so surprised. I heard you lecture at the Travellers Club a couple of years ago. I used to do a bit of exploring myself. I went on one of the university expeditions to the Antarctic. I don't understand. I know enough about you, Mrs. Strangeways, to be quite sure that if you really wanted to steal things from this store, you'd have no difficulty getting away with it. So, I asked myself, why does the astute Mrs. Strangeways allow herself to be caught red-handed? That answer came there none. How long have you been a member of English Banner, Mr... Dickon. Uh, Mr. Dickon. Never heard of it. English what? That window looks out on the front of this store, doesn't it? Just go over and glance down. Well? See those groups of men hanging about by the entrances? Yes, I do. They're waiting to get hold of me. I'm working for the special branch, counter-espionage. It's vital that I get away from here today. This is something big, Mr. Dickens, so big that I don't tell you more. Indeed, I may have been mistaken in telling you so much. What about the police? Well, I had rather hoped that you'd escort me to the nearest police station for shoplifting. I've been wandering about for hours trying to think of a way out. But now I'd much rather that the police were not brought into it. I see. Well, tell me, where roughly do you want to get to? London? Uh, further west, shall we say? Excuse me. Oh, hello? Uh, the furnishing oh. department? Tell me, what vans do we have going out today? Darling, Mr. Dickon, I'll really have to take you with me on an expedition someday. What a comfort you'd be. Of course it was a penalty, but it wasn't given because the referee wasn't looking. Wasn't looking? Wasn't looking, he was bloody blind, that's why. Language, Joe. Uh, you all right, miss? Hmm? Oh, sorry. I was dozing. Yes, yes, I'm all right. Do I look all right? Well, to tell you the truth, that cap and moustache makes you look a bit like Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> <laughs> the boiler suit doesn't help. How far have we come? Uh, about 45 miles. It'll be getting dark soon. I can't help feeling that we're not going to get away as easily as this. Are you prepared for anything? Well, it will take a lot to stop this van. What did you say about trouble, miss? There's two cars across the road ahead. Yeah. What should we do? Ram them. Good man. Yeah, what would have damage to the van? Well, Mr. Dickon will take care of that. Right, stand by. Oh. I'm putting my foot down. Now, when we hit him, hold on tight. Ready? 
Warm work. <laughs> They'll not try that again in a hurry. I sincerely hope not. Either it was a penalty or it wasn't, right? Well, that's it, it wasn't. Look, I'll give you it was a hard tackle, but now I'm not so sure. Hard tackle? It was a bloody disgrace, huh? man. Oh. oh, what's happening? See what you've done with your language and shouting. Oh, I am sorry, miss. Where are we? Evesham. We'll be in Gloucester soon. Then it's only 50 miles to Oxford. Gloucester? Aye. I have been asleep. <laughs> what are those lights up there? Where? Oh, yeah. oh, it's another roadblock, a big one up there, you see? Ah, oh, the cunning beggars, halfway up the hill by the look of it. Just we'll have to slow down. Oh, we'll not get past that. Sorry, miss. Damn. All right, I'll, I'll drop off round the next corner. Whatever you say, miss. Hey, you Joe, can... uh, stand by to open that door. Tell them you dropped me off at Evesham. Aye, OK. I'm slowing down now. Now get ready. Goodbye. And thank you for your help. Good luck, miss. At least I shall be able to get rid of this ridiculous moustache. Right, we're coming to the bend now. You ready, Joe? Aye. Now, jump! Do close the window, Robert. It's getting cold. In a moment, my dear. What are those flashes? Lightning, my dear, very bright and with a pinkish tinge. I don't think it's lightning. No, it's something to do with that aeroplane that flew over just now. Flares, probably, looking for somewhere to land. Nonsense, Aggie, there's not an aerodrome for miles. Besides, the phenomenon of lightning without thunder is... Uh... God bless my soul. An aviatrix. And in my rose bed. Are you all right, my dear? Did you, did you crash? Uh, just a moment. We're, we're coming down. Here you are. Nice hot drink. Uh, Herbert, I think you'd just better tidy the spare room. Yes, of course, my dear. Right and here. don't forget to put a hot bottle in the bed. No, oh, yes, my dear. God bless myself. Now, what's all this about an aeroplane, my dear? Uh, a white lie, I'm afraid. There was a plane. It was dropping flares. I knew it. Looking for me, I think. You see, I'm on the run, engaged in undercover police work. Really? How interesting. Oh, I know it sounds fantastic, but it's true. I dropped off a lorry just outside Evesham and made my way across country. First an aeroplane and now a lorry. Perhaps it would be as well if I rang the police, just in case. No, please, it really is undercover work. You could ring Sir John Strangeways at Scotland Yard. Oh, no... I forgot he's still in hospital. Oh, dear. I... I'll go, Herbert. Oh, do you think you ought to? I, I mean... Now, don't worry, my dear. We're quite used to late callers at the vicarage. You just sit there and finish your drink. Good evening. Mrs Fortescue, isn't it? Yes. We're plainclothes police officers, madam. We're looking for a woman wanted on a car stealing charge. She was last seen in this vicinity. Uh, could we come in for a moment? There's no such woman here, I assure you. She may have broken into the house without your knowing. I don't think so. You've no objection to us searching the house, just in case? Oh, none at all. Oh, you have a search warrant, of course. Oh, well, as a matter of You fact. haven't? Well, in that case, Look, no, I'm, I'm afraid... Look, I must insist. Insist all you like, but you're not entering this house without a search warrant. I'm sorry, but you see, we get so many beggars and undesirables at the vicarage that I can't possibly let you in until you've established your bona fides. And you see, not only have you no search warrant, but so far you haven't shown me any sort of identification. But on the other hand, my husband could ring the police station. Uh, that and... won't be necessary, madam. Good night. Good night. Good night, gentlemen. Have they gone? Yes, yes, you're quite safe. Policemen, indeed. They're too shifty by half. And anyway, their clothes were far too good. <laughs> And since when did the police drop flares to catch a car thief? No. Fantastic, though it seems. On the whole, I'm inclined to believe your story. Oh, thank you. And you will let me stay tonight? Yes, of course. More coffee? No, thank you, Mrs Fortescue. 
Herbert's gone over to the church so we can have a nice little chat. Oh, by the way, there's something in the paper this morning about Sir John Strangeways. Uncle John? Is he all right? Still critical, but they have hopes of an ultimate recovery. Thank goodness. Uncle John. Your Georgia Strangeways, the explorer, of course. <laughs> I thought I recognised you from somewhere. I'm rather glad I trusted you now. So am I. Thank you. Mind you, it was touch and go. Well, now, what is your next move? I, I don't really know. Only that I have to get away without being seen. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to reach Oxford. My husband's there. But someone is trying to stop me. There are quite a lot of them, I'm afraid. Tell me, do you know anything about eurythmics? Eurythmics? Well, I used to do them at school. I should think my kind would be rather out of date now. Why do you ask? Because I think the Radiance girls are the answer to your problem. <laughs> <laughs> the Radiance girl? Yes, Herbert thinks it's all rather pagan, but as I tell him, if the morals of this village can't stand up to a few strapping young ladies in magenta knickers... <laughs> magenta? Besides, we get them free. They're giving an exhibition at the village hall tonight, the Sisterhood of Radiance. Between ourselves, it's all rather soppy. But what has all this to do with me? Simply this. They come in a private bus, you see, so if you were to become a Radiance girl, you could leave with them. Mrs. Fortescue, you're a genius. <laughs> but would they let me join the troupe? You leave that to me, my dear. <laughs> Nonsense. Mabel can't possibly be ill. She is, I'm afraid. Something she ate. You'll just have to perform without her. We do not perform. We interpret. We are vessels. We receive. And we pour out. But of course we can't possibly go on now, out of the question. Seven, you see. We must have seven, the seven-pointed star. Perhaps Miss Lestrange here could help you out. Really? Yes. Tell me, are you initiated? Are you one of us? In my own circle, I am known as the seventh pillar of light. Oh, how very interesting. Now, show me what you can do. La, 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 yes, I can see you have the tone, the vibrations. Hmm. Yes, all the same, I think you'd better stay at the back of the stage, dear. Now, I'll just dash and get your costume. Don't go away. Let's hope the stage is not too well lit. The hall's nearly full. Any strangers? Not that I can see. There's one odd thing. There's a Mr. Raynham standing at the back of the hall, watching mm -hmm. everything very carefully. Is he a local? Yes, came here about five years ago, a gentleman farmer. If you ask me, he never was a gentleman, and he'll never be a farmer. <laughs> well, what happens now? Well, usually, Miss Agthorsby delivers some poems of her own. Goodness, they're quite awful, I'm afraid. And after that, well, the fun begins. <laughs> oh, dear. Job, oh, that's a tidy bit of goods in front. Just look at them bloomers. <laughs> Good night, and thank you so much for a, 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 a wonderful evening. Not one of our better exhibitions, I'm afraid. Those dreadful men. Now, girls, Goodbye. Go. Good luck. Goodbye. I don't know how to thank you. Take care. Somebody broke into the vicarage this evening. Ring the police as soon as I've gone. Mm. I think I will. Mm. Now, that's 
Someone waving this down up ahead, Mum. Might be an accident. I see her. It's a stop. Yes, Mum. Oh, what a night! Sorry to hold you up and all that. I was driving a friend to Cheltenham. The car broke down. Oh, yes, sir. He's in rather a hurry. Train to catch. Do you mind if we come along with you? He's blind, you see. Oh, but of course you will come with us. Poor oh, man. Thank you so much. Most kind. This way, sir. There now. You sit here next to this young lady. She'll look after you. I'll sit over here. All right, driver. Hurry up, sir. Evening, Georgia. Fancy meeting you here. You've led me quite a dance, my dear. Are you ready to come quietly, as they say? And if I don't? My friend, Mr. Raynham, has a revolver. He will compel the driver to take a side road and everyone on the bus will be shot. I can't leave any loose ends now. You leave me no choice. Exactly. Raynham. Stop the bus. What the blow? They seem to have got our car going. It's coming along behind. We'd better change back into it. All oh, right, you are. Uh, this young lady is also going to Cheltenham. We may as well give her a lift. Oh, I'm not sure that I can allow it. It's quite all right, Miss Hackthorsby. This gentleman is an old friend of mine. Oh, well, if you say so. Good night. Thank you all so much. Thanks, sir. Oh, uh, please, don't worry about your friend. She'll be quite safe with me. smell. Ugh. The plans. Still there, thank goodness. Oh, Nigel, why aren't you here? To think it must all end like this. What's that? I'll do it by myself. Close the door behind you. No. No. Don't bother to put the light on. Well, Georgia, get to the post, I'm afraid. <laughs> you know, I've been looking forward to our reunion. You very nearly blinded me with that damned extinguisher. They say I may recover my sight eventually. <laughs> I'm afraid you won't recover yours, my dear. I shall make quite sure of that. Wouldn't you like to scream or something? No one will hear you. No. Well, I hope you'll enjoy our little game of blind man's buff. I'm coming to get you now. Georgia. Hey, what's going on? Urgent message for the chief. Well, he's busy downstairs. Here's my authority. Open up, blast you. It's urgent. Very urgent. You... Everything okay? All okay, thanks. Chief told me to take this dame away. What's left of her? And dig a nice big hole. <sighs> she did us a lot of harm. Where's the chief? Busy with the message I gave him. So long, and thanks. Put her down over there, on the sofa. Oh. I... Oh, where am I? I... I must have fainted, uh. It's all right, Georgia, my dear. You're safe at last. Uncle John? Here, drink this. Oh. But... 
But they said you were in hospital. Oh, I'm much tougher than I look, my dear. But I thought it best not to let the English banner know. But how did you find me? Is Nigel all right? Where is he? Oh, uh... Ah, no, no, no. One thing at a time. Nigel is well. He's waiting for you at Oxford. I've had the devil's own job keeping him out of it, especially when we heard that you were on the run. We found you by keeping a very careful watch on Lord Cantilow. We knew he'd have to come out into the open when Alison told us you'd got the plans. He followed you. We followed him. My chap saw him stop the bus last night. <laughs> what queer company you keep, Georgia. <laughs> well, my chaps followed you to that cottage, but we didn't dare attack in force in case he killed you. No. He wasn't going to kill me. Uh, Cantilow won't be allowed much more rope, my dear. How was he when you left? Unconscious, I'm afraid, sir. Well done. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, what about these plans? Oh, I shall uh, have to undress a bit, I'm afraid. I've been using them to pad out my rather meagre figure. <coughs> really? Actually, there are, there are two plans. One on paper and one in my head. Oh. Ooh. You've done well, my dear. Very well. Oh, Uncle John, he was going to put out my eyes. Was he? <laughs> was he indeed? The smiler with the knife under the cloak. Well, don't worry, my dear, it's all over. The cottage is surrounded. He won't get away, and by tonight the English banner will have ceased to exist. Cantilo will never harm anyone again. England is safe, my dear, thanks to you. We're all safe. All the decent, ordinary, hard-working people. The people who make up England. Oh, Uncle John. There, there, Georgia. It's all over now. Who was that on the phone, Nigel? Uncle John. Apparently mm. all the English banner leaders have to stand trial. Except... Yes? Except Chilton Cantelow. Don't mean he's to go free. free. No, no. Apparently, he's been committed to an asylum. Spends all his time playing with a mechanical race game and a rocking horse. Poor chap. Oh God. What's in the post, darling? Just the usual, circulars and bills and. Good heavens! I don't believe it. What is it? Just listen to this. Hmm. Inasmuch as we have failed to cut our hedge, huh. we have to appear before a justice of the peace. We are to be prosecuted. Do you think they'll put us in prison? Oh, sure to. Tired <laughs> of London. We've broken the law. We must pay. Well, well, the thanks of a grateful country. Give it to me. I shall wear it next to my heart forever. <laughs> <laughs> That was The Smiler with the Knife by Nicholas Blake, dramatised by Barry Campbell. The part of Georgia Strangeways was played by Jackie Smith Wood and Nigel Strangeways by Simon Cadell. Sir John Strangeways, Jack May, Lord Cantelow, John Rye, Alison Grove, Susie Brown, Peter Braithwaite, Christopher Douglas, Madame Alvarez, Avril Clark, Senor Alvarez, Tim Reynolds, Celia Mayfield, Deborah Makepeace, Major Keston, David Sinclair. Professor Hargreaves Steele, Richard Durden, Mrs. Fortescue, Jill Balkan, Reverend Fortescue, Peter Howell, Miss Egg Thorsby, Pauline Letts. With Andrew Branch, John Church, Elaine Claxton, Stephen Harold, Sean Prendergast, Natasha Pine, Gordon Reed, Eric Stovell, and Jonathan Taffler. The Smiler with the Knife was directed by Jane Morgan. We present More Work for The Undertaker by Marjorie Allingham, dramatised for radio by Margaret Etall, with Francis Matthews as Albert Campion, Geoffrey Matthews as Lug, and Tim Meats as Detective Inspector Luke. The setting for More Work for The Undertaker is London, 1946. Lug, put out my tails, will you? 
going it a bit, aren't we? Now we're back from the wars. Yes. Who's a lucky party this time? Just do it, Lug. All right, cock, keep your hair on. Why we are short today. Did you have a nice time with Mr. Oates, then? Oh, very pleasant. We sat in the park. Oh, very helpful. Yeah, very. We watched a charming old lady in a motoring veil and six different dresses and grass in her shoes receive sixpence from a passing do-gooder. Apparently a daily occurrence. A simple mendicant. <laughs> Blimey, don't they give Oatsy Boy anything to do at the yard now he runs the place? Ah, the sister of the lady in the park died recently. What's that got to do with us? Well, she may have been helped on her way. Poisoned. Oh, yeah? Yes, Oates has put Superintendent Yeo onto it, and Yeo wants me to make a few discreet inquiries. Oh, was he there too? Chief busybody's get-together, was it? Hmm. Thought he was giving all that up and going to be respectable. A government island. Oh, um, I've got me advert written out. Got a what? My advert. Gentleman's gentleman seeks interesting employment. Remarkable references. Title preferred. I see. Yeah, well, that's about it. I can't come with you, cock. I don't want to see myself an international incident. Yeah. But uh, can't you oblige the Chief Justice once? No, I fear not, no. But it is interesting. Mm. It's the Palinode family are relics of a gracious past. They're odd and brainy, but not the sort who get poisoned. Well, could happen to anybody. Yes, well, they'll know soon enough. They're digging the poor sister up again, Miss Ruth Palinode. Uh, it tickles your fancy, doesn't it? Can't resist it. As a matter of fact, Reenie Roper has asked me to go and stay for a bit. Well, that nice old stage lady, mm. how does she fit in? Well, she apparently now owns the house where all the Palino tribe live. Mm. Well, those are the left, anyway. So she's naturally very concerned. Yeah, what a coincidence. Must be an omen. No, two crows don't make a summons lug. You need... Here Three for that. Move your arms. What's Come the on. time? Hmm? I've got to ring Lord Dodaway before five. Oh, so it's final then. You're going to accept? Yes, I am. Yeah, better tell the lady wife then. Lady Amanda rang up and asked, but I said I didn't know. What's this? Hmm? Courtesy, sympathy, comfort in transit. <clears throat> Jazz Bowles and Son, the practical undertakers, 12 Apron Street, West 3. Apron Street is where the Palinodes live. That is a private letter, that is. Mm. Oh, well, go on, read it if you like. To Mr. Magus Fontaine Lug, Esquire, care of a Campion Esquire, 12A Bottle Street, Piccadilly, West 1. Dear Magus, if Beatty was alive, which she is not, more's the pity, she would be writing this instead of me, me and, and the boy. boy. We was wondering this dinner time. Can you get your governor to give us a bit of a hand in this palinode kick-up, which you may have read of in the papers? Exhumations, as we call them in the trade, are not very nice and bad for business. Without disrespect, bring him along for a bit of tea and a joy any day, as we do not do much after 3.30, and we'll do less if this goes on. Remembering you very kindly and all forgotten. All forgotten, I hope. Yours truly, Jas Bowles. Amazing mm. cheek, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, he's a horrible man. Seems to know you pretty well. He's my brother-in-law. <laughs> Married me only sister. The poor worm shoveler. I see. Yeah, during the war, that was the first war, I mean. <laughs> Haven't spoken to him for 30 years. <laughs> Come my little trip inside, he behaved as though I took him with me. Sent back me wedding present to be. And I wrote him clean off me slate. Now he pops up out of the past and asks a favour when I couldn't help him if I could bring myself to it. Is this a put-up job? Uh, some remarks I do not, yeah. Yes, when exactly did this arrive? Ten minutes ago, late post. No need to get excited. What's jazz to you, anyway? The third crow, it seems. Oh, yeah? Yes. Shall I uh, get his lordship for you? No. Get me Chief Superintendent Yeo. Charlie Luke, sir. Hmm. Superintendent Yeo said I'd find you here. <laughs> I'm glad to see you. I hope it's not as bad as that. <laughs> That's our ration. Four doubles each. Oh, good. Mar Chubb looks after us here at the plate layers, but she says it'll have to last the night. <laughs> it's gold dust these days. It's very generous. 
Tell me, how many palinode murders have you actually got on your hands? I don't know of any for certain. Mm. Not yet. I don't know what you've heard so far, but I'll rough it in as it's come to me. It began with Dr. Smith, a tallish old boy married to a shrew. Starts getting poison pen letters. Oh, yeah. I'll show you the filth later. Mm. But chiefly, accuse him of conniving at murder. Old lady called Ruth Palinode, murdered, buried, no questions asked, Doc to blame. Doc gets wind up slowly. Bill's patients may be getting the same letters. I'm called in. Now we go to Apron Street. That's the, uh, the Palinode house, is it? No, not yet. No. Street important. Mm. Narrow little way. Old Brotherhood Chapel, now the Thespis Rep Theatre. Highbrow, harmless, one end. Portminster Lodge, the Palinode house, the other. The district's gone down like a drunk in 30 years, and the Palinodes with it. Now, a dear old variety gal turned lodging house keeper owns their house. Mortgage fell in. She inherited. Her own place got blitzed. So she moved over with some of her old boarders and took the Palinode family in her stride. Oh, well, Miss Rope is an old acquaintance of mine. She did me a very good turn back in 36, when I was having a bit of bother with some ballet stars. Did she, though? Then you can tell me something. Could she have written the letters? Well, I don't know sufficiently well to say. I should have guessed she was the last person in the world not to have signed her name. Oh, so should I. I love her. We're going on the halls, we are. <laughs> but you never know, do you? <laughs> Anyone else? Who might have written them? Mm. About 500. Any one of the duck's patients. I'll drink up, sir. And I'll give you the smell of the street. Ah. Lots of small shops. Family businesses. I've known the Palinodes forever, on good terms with Rini. One of them's a chemist. Oh, what an emporium. Great jars of coloured water in the window. Dozens of little drawers of muck. Smell of old lady's bedroom enough to knock your back. An old Pa Wild in the middle of it looking like Auntie's ruin with his dyed hair and little black tie. When old Joey and Pantaloon Bowles dug up Miss Ruth Palinode, I must say I started thinking about Pa Wild. I don't, I don't mean he administered whatever it was, but I bet it came from there. When do you expect the analyst's report? <clears throat> Midnight. Hmm. If it's something that could only have been criminally administered, we wake up the undertakers and dig up the brother right away. Well, that's the eldest brother, I take it. Yes. Edward Palinode, aged 67 at the time of his decease seven months ago. Hmm. So, what is the... after the chemist? Opposite the chemist, Pa Wilde, there's only that old blighter bowels. The bank, the entrance to the mews, which goes down to Barrow Road, and the worst pub in the world, the footman. Portminster Lodge is on the corner, same side as the chemist's. Enormous. Basement kitchen where Rini entertains her chums. Palinodes as boarders, and one or two others. Old variety turn called Clary Grace, just oh, out of the no. RAF. And a Captain Seaton. Oh, look through there. Hmm? He's in the bar now, having his weekly half-pint. Oh, yeah. Socially party over in the corner. Quite the dandy, isn't he? Yes. Lives on next to nothing but keeps up appearances. He was Rini's pet boarder in her other house, so she brought him with her. He's one of the better rooms now. I think in a funny way he's enjoying all this. Bit of excitement, you see. Why don't you want to talk about the Palinodes, Inspector? can't. Why? Don't understand them. But how do you mean? Just that. I don't understand what they say. Uh, uh, long words? Not particularly. But when I read the verbatim reports, I keep sending for the stenographer to see if he's got the words right. He doesn't know either. I see. <laughs> There's three of them left, I can tell you that. Mr. Lawrence, Miss Evadne... And the baby, Miss Jessica. Now, she's the girl with the concertina stockings who gets presents in the park. She does crosswords in Latin. I've seen them. They're not balmy, any of them. God knows why anyone should kill them. I gather you're moving in, sir. Mm, at once, I thought. I brought a bag with me. Rini's passing me off as her nephew. Oh, it's good news to me. Mm? Sorry I can't give you a line on these people, Mr. Kempion. But they're old-fashioned and out of the ordinary. I've got the stage where as soon as I think of them, I feel a bit faint. 
I'll send you word of the analyst's report as soon as I get it. Oh, blast. <clears throat> Who is it? Oh, it's you, Ducky. Yeah. Oh, come in, do. Right. There. Oh, this is good of you. I appreciate it and I shan't forget it. Oh. Now, how's your mother? Nicely? As well as can be expected, Aunt Rini. Oh, <laughs> but I know well. We mustn't grumble. Now, come along to the kitchen, dear. Clary, I don't think you've met my nephew, Albert. <laughs> He's the one from Berry, the knobby side of the family, dear. <laughs> He's a lawyer. And one does so need one at a time like this. Oh, I'm glad to be here, Auntie. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. My name's Grace, Clarence Grace. Oh. I don't suppose you've heard of it. Now sit down, Ducky. I expect you're hungry and I'll find you something. Oh, thank you, Auntie. I've already eaten. Oh, are you sure? Oh, yes, absolutely. I had something on the train. Oh, well, that's a mercy anyway. Have a drop of Clary Stout then, dear, while I get on with your bed. It's quite a nice room, and uh, no one's died in it, in my time at any rate, so you needn't be nervous. Have some beer. Oh, thank you. You know, <clears throat> Rini's been a pal of mine ever since I was a nipper, and somehow I can't see you being her nephew. I should have heard of you before. I must have. She's one of the very best, Rini is. Your old man wasn't really her brother, was he? Uh, only in a manner of speaking. Oh, no. oh, that's rich. That's Wizzo. I shall use that. You're a laugh, you are. <laughs> You're going to cheer us up. Here, keep up your strength. They can't get at the bottle stuff. Yeah. Who? The family. The Pally Alley is upstairs. Oh. Roll me over. You don't think Irene or I or even Captain Excuse My Glove have been going in for chemistry, do you? We're all right. We've known each other for donkey's years. It's the Pally Alleys, that's certain. But they can't get at the beer. Check the seals myself. I should hardly think you were all in much danger of indiscriminate poisoning. I mean, it's not as if any further attempt has been made, is it? My dear old boy, you're a lawyer. You don't see the situation in a human light. Of course we're all in danger. There's a killer about, isn't there? Besides, what about the brother, the first one? He died, didn't he, last March? The police will be having him up next. They're all in it together. That's my theory. Well, I realise they're eccentric. Eccentric? Oh, good Lord, no. They're all number eight hats and very quite, quite. Their old man was a sort of genius, a professor. Letters after his name. Old Miss Ruth wasn't up to the family standard. She was going a bit. Used to forget her own name and take her plate out in public and that sort of thing generally. Thought she was invisible, probably. I think the others just got together and talked it over and she couldn't make the grade. Where could I meet one of them? Well, you could go up now, Ducky, if you cared to. Take that tray up to Miss Evadne for me. Somebody's got to do it. Dear me, what a collection. Oh, never you mind. That's what she has. <laughs> there you are. First floor, third door on the left. Right. Clary, mm -hmm. you can do Mr. Lawrence tonight. Take him a kettle and he can mix it himself. Right. Uh, come in. Do come in. I'm just going. I'll let myself out, Miss Palinode. Put it here, on this little table. And be careful of those glasses, if you please. They're very rare. Haired groom, what gars thy pipe so loud? Why bidden thy looks so snicker and so proud? Perdy plain peers, but this cooth ill agree with thick bad fortune, which I thwarteth thee. Hmm. That thwarteth me, good palinode, is fate. Eborn was peers to be unfortunate. Infortunate. 
So, you're an actor, of course. I ought to have known. Mr. Roper has so many friends from the stage. Tell me, out of a shop. I'm afraid I haven't acted for some considerable time. Oh, never mind. We must see what we can do. Now, let me see what you've brought me. Oh, yes. Splendid. Now, tip the egg into the slip, right? In, in? Uh, yes, go on, straight in. Stir as you go. Don't spill it. I dislike dirty saucer. <laughs> now the sugar. Yeah, that's quite right. Uh, hand the cup to me and keep the spoon, for if you've mixed it rightly, I shall not need it. Yes, that's very nicely done. Oh, good. I think I must ask you to my theatrical afternoon next Tuesday. You would like to come, of course. Mm. It might lead to something, but I can't promise. The repertory theatre is overcrowded this year, but I'm afraid you know that. I believe there is a small theatre near here, isn't there? Indeed, there is. The Thespis. Very hard-working little troupe. Some of them are quite talented, and once a month they all come here to a little conversazione, and we have some amusing talk. <laughs> I did wonder if perhaps I should put it off next week. We've had a little awkwardness in the house. expect you've heard of it. Mm. But on the whole, I think I shall carry on as usual. The only difficulty is those wretched newspaper men. Although, in fact, they bother my brother far more than they do me. Yes, I, th I think I saw your brother as I came in. Oh, oh no. That was not Lawrence. Lawrence is a, a rather different person. Oh. No, that was little Mr. James, our bank manager. I always get him to come over when I have any business. It's very little trouble for him. When you came in, I wondered if you were one of the reporters, but as soon as you capped my little piece of peel, I knew I was <laughs> wrong. I, uh, I've got this thing for you. I worked it out in rough sky to the turf, but I've mislaid it. Well, have you corn throbbed? Well, of course I have. As I've always said, the foreign wheat was completely witless. What she was doing was dangerous. Does it matter oh, now? Uh, After uh, all, the sheaves of alien corn are gathered. Yeah, all the same, I had to test it. You must see that I am right. Oh, uh, good evening, to you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Uh, Oh, that was my brother, Lawrence. Oh. He is extremely clever. Of its kind, a most ingenious mind. He prepares all the crossword puzzles for the literary weekly in his spare time. Ah. Although his real work is on the origins of Arthur. He has so many subjects. Including horse racing, no doubt. Horse racing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. But only on paper. Um, what does corn throat mean? Oh, to search, simply. Ah. A family reference. <laughs> you may take the tray now. Oh, uh, thank you. Good evening, Miss Palino. What? There's a light switch by your side, Ducky. Oh, just, just a... Here, I've got a letter for you. Oh, really? Thank you. <clears throat> oh. Dear sir, re Ruth Palino deceased. Analysts report to hand, oh, 30, 30 hours, hours this morning. morning. Organs contain two-thirds grain hyacin in available material, indicating much larger dose. Probably administered in form hyacin hydrobromide, but no evidence to show if taken subcutaneously or by mouth. Normal medicinal dose, one-hundredth to one-fiftieth grain. Re Edward von Creighton Palino deceased. Proposed to have up, pronto. Belvedere Cemetery, Wills Witch, huh? 4 a.m. approximately. Cordial invitation extended. No offence taken if you cut it. C. Luke D.D.I. <clears throat> well, now, what's this for? Steady my nerves. <laughs> Must I? Oh, the whiskey's all right. Mm. Take my dying oath, it is. I've had it under lock and key. Did the policeman wake you? 
Oh. I'm so sorry. There was no great urgency. No, I was about, you know. Mm. Well, I got used to pottering around at night during the war. <clears throat> the air raid wardens were always popping in. <laughs> I want to talk to you, Mr. Campion. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want just to tell you this. I'm absolutely on the level with you. I'm more than grateful to you, and you really can trust me. I shan't keep anything back, and I mean that, see? Hmm? <laughs> What's on your conscience, Auntie? <laughs> oh, well, there's one little thing that's been going on for a long time, and I feel I ought to mention it, dear, just so that you don't go rooting it out and being surprised. <laughs> Hello. I do beg your pardons. Oh. I was passing the door and thought the room was un unoccupied. My attention was caught by the shaft of light. Oh, go along with you. You smelt it. Come along. There's a tooth glass over there. Bring it here. Here. There. Ah, this is Captain Seaton, Albert. Oh, hello. Now, it's quite a good thing you've come, because you can tell Mr. Campion exactly how it was that Miss Ruth was taken ill. I didn't kill the lady. On the contrary, I, I did what I could. I found her in the hall about half past twelve. There she was, crimson in the face, and shouting out what sounded like a lot of figures. But she couldn't articulate properly, so I knew she was ill, not just mad. Well, the doctor told me ages ago her blood pressure nearly broke his instrument. Got her to her room, sat her in the only chair free of books and covered her over and went for the sawbones next door. He was just off to officiate at a, a birth of some sort and, and said he'd come back when he could. I came back and took another look at her and uh, she seemed to have gone to sleep. That's right, dear. When I looked in about two, she was breathing rather heavily, but I thought we'd better leave her till the doctor came. When was that? Nearly three. Uh -huh. And she was dead by then. He certified thrombosis. He was expecting it. Well, I couldn't blame him. Yet someone did. Oh, people will talk. Any sudden death makes a lot of stink. At any rate, I did not kill the vulgar trollop. I had words with her, I admit it, and I still feel I was within my rights. But once and for all, I did not kill her! Oh, shush. Don't wait the house, dear. Good night. Many thanks. Good night. Oh, there, silly <laughs> old fool. <laughs> Now all that'll have to come out, I suppose. It's only because of the room. Old people are like children. They get jealous. I gave him a nice room when we came here and Ruth always wanted it. She said she'd had it as a child and when she found she couldn't get any change out of me, she had to go at him. That's all there was to it, really. I'm not lying, Ducky. Though he was too footling to mention. Was that the awful secret you were going to uncover? What? Me and the captain? Yes. Oh, 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 my dear, we've lived in the same house for nearly 30 years. You don't want a detective to find out any secret there. You want a time machine. <laughs> no. No, I was going to tell you about the coffin cupboard. I beg your pardon? Well, of course, it may not be coffins. Well, I've never seen inside. Suppose you tell me what you're talking about. Well, I've let one of my cellars, Ducky, the little ones leading off the area around by the front door, and not actually in the house at all, to old Mr. Bowles, the undertaker. What? Well, he asked me as a special favour, and I didn't like to refuse him. When was this? Oh, years ago. Well, months, anyway. Well, he's always very quiet, but, well, I thought you might possibly hear him and his son down there tonight and wonder what it was. Is he here? Well, if he isn't, he soon will be. He popped in when you was up with Miss Evadney to say I wasn't to be nervous if I heard him moving about between three and four. No, but he'll be at... Oh, no, of course. They didn't bury him. Mr. Edward? No, Bowles and son didn't know. Oh, there was a fuss about that. Mr. Edward had it put in his will, the thoughtless old man. Oh, he was full of smarty ideas. He lost the family, their money being so clever. Well, there you are, my dear. Yeah. Now, if you hear any thumping, it's just the undertaker. Oh, the ultimate reassurance. Oh. Are we going to have a look? Oh, I've never liked to spy on him. It's three or four months since he came last. Lead the way. Is that them? This way. 
We'll go in the drawing room. There's a window there, just above the cellar steps. Keep close to me. Good heavens. Whatever is that smell? Oh, that's all right. That's nothing. In here. Can you hear them now? Yeah. Shine your torch, Ducky. You'll see better. Oh! Oh! Edward von Cretan Palinode, born September the 4th, 1878, died March the 2nd, 1946. Mr. Edward's coffin. Yes. Oh, how can it be? Oh, oh, uh, uh, good, good evening, sir. Uh, we did not disturb you, I hope. I don't think nothing of it. Wait there a moment. I want a word with you. What are you doing? Stock taking? Uh, uh, not exactly, sir, not exactly, although there are likenesses. It is Mr. Campin I'm addressing, isn't it? That's right. I'm Jazz Bowles, at your service any time of the night or day, and this is my son, uh, Roly Boy. Here, Dad. I'm just taking this casket across. We hire the cellar, you see, sir, and I've had the casket in there a month or so while we was full up over the road. Now I thought, what with one thing and another, the police and that, I'd better get her back home. She looks a very fine affair. Oh, she is, sir, a very special job, one of our deluxe types. A casket like that would be a credit to anybody. Mm, yet the man whose address is on the label had other views. Ah, uh, uh, you saw it, sir. <laughs> I'm caught and I may as well admit it. He saw your nameplate, Roly Boy. Uh, He's very fly, is Mr Campion. I ought to have known that from all I've heard from your Uncle Maggers. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, vanity, Mr C. That's what that there nameplate shows you, the vanity of Jaspowles. There was a gentleman in this house once that me and the boy took a real fancy to. Am I right, Roly? As you say, Dad. Mr Edward Palinode. A lovely name for a headstone. You're trying to tell me you made it on speculation, I take it. Ah. I see we can talk, you and me, sir. <laughs> I've had old maggers all the evening, and I thought, well, anyone who employs you must know what's what, I thought. But I wasn't sure, you see. Yes, of course. I made it on APRO, and the perishing old blighter wouldn't have it. Matter of fact, I made it to fit myself. He was no bigger than what I am. She's a lovely job. Solid oak, veneered ebony. If you'll come over to the shop in the morning, sir, I'll show her to you in the light. It, uh, it wouldn't take me a moment to come down now. No, we won't impose on you, sir. Take her along, boy. What, that... We've got to get her across the road while it's dark, sir, if you'll excuse us. Is, um, is Lug with you? He's in bed, sir. <sighs> Good night, sir. We feel it's an honour to have met you. Uh, see you in the morning, I hope. Good night, sir. Uh, yes, that's it, Rowley. Now, uh... He's a very good man. He's thought very highly of in the street. But I never feel I can get to the bottom of him. I wonder what he's got at the bottom of the coffin. Oh, well, but it was empty. There wasn't a body in it. There wasn't there. Perhaps just a little foreign body. Oh. And now, Auntie, since we appear to overcome any initial shyness and we can speak from the heart, the stink coming up from your basement can no longer be ignored. <laughs> Come on, darling, tell me the truth. What's cooking? Oh, get along with you. It's only old Miss Jessica. It pleases her and it doesn't hurt anybody else. But I won't have it in the daytime because she gets in the way and, yes, there really is an awful smell. Oh, it's worse than usual tonight. Whew. I've got a fine old menagerie here, haven't you? What's she doing? Oh, making little mucks, dear. I don't think they're quite medicine, but she lives on them. Eh? Hey? Oh, don't you be silly, dear. Now you're making me feel quite jumpy. We've had our bit of excitement for tonight. Where is she? May I go and see her? Oh, my dear, you can do what you like. I told you that. She's quite harmless and the cleverest of the three in one way. At least she can look after herself. Go on, you go down. Just follow your nose. All right, go and get your beauty sleep. Oh, I need it, do I? <laughs> oh, you're laughing. <laughs> oh, you are a naughty boy. I'm staying here. I smelled something, so I came down. No one warned you, I suppose. The inefficiency in this house is quite extraordinary. Well, never mind. I'm sorry you were disturbed. 
Now you know what it is, you can go back to bed. Oh, I don't think I shall rest. Can I help? No, I don't think so. It's not very difficult, and as a recreation, I find it amusing, even. People make a drudgery of feeding themselves. That's very ridiculous. I make it a relaxation, and I get on very well. I see you do. You're very alert. That doesn't suggest improper food. That's very true. Now, would you like a nice cup of nettle tea? It's quite as nice as yerba mate and very good for one as well. Well, thank you. Good. I don't quite understand, though. What are you doing? Cooking. <laughs> it may seem peculiar to you that I have to do it in the middle of the night in my own home, but there's an excellent explanation for that. Uh, have you heard of a man called Herbert Boone? Uh, no. Well, there you are, you see. Hardly anybody has. He wrote a book called How to Live on One and Six. Now, this was written in 1917, of course, nearly 30 years ago. Since then, the index figure has risen by approximately 40%, so we must translate that as roughly two and a penny. It still sounds miraculous, doesn't it? It does indeed. Do you do it? Live on two and a penny? Yes. Oh, I do, nearly. I I'll lend you the book. It answers such a lot of people's problems. I should think it might. Dear me, yes. Now, what's in there, may I ask? Hmm? Oh, in this tin? Well, the thing that's been smelling, rather, is, is over there. It's embrocation for the grocer's knee. But this is broth for the sheep's jawbone, not the whole head. That's too expensive, but cooked with herbs, it does very well. Look, is this really necessary? Do you mean, am I so poor that I have to live like this? Or are you merely inquiring if I'm mad? Uh, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't really understand at all. I have less money than the others, not because I'm the youngest because I trusted my elder brother to invest the greater part of my inheritance. He was a man of ideas, but he was not very practical. He lost all our money. I will not tell you my exact weekly income now, but it is counted in shillings and not in pounds. Oh, this is the tea, is it? Where do you get the nettles? Hyde Park. There are lots of weeds. I mean, herbs there, if one hunts for them. I made a mistake or two at first. You have to be exact, you know, with plants. And I was quite ill several times, but I've mastered it now, I think. Taste it, and if you can't bear it, I shall understand. But you must read the book. Uh -huh. Oh. <laughs> Lawrence doesn't like it either, but he drinks it. <laughs> and he drinks this yarrow tea I make. He's very interested, but he's more conventional than I am. He doesn't really approve of my having no use for money. Although I don't know what he'd do if I had. But he has none. Is all this helping you, do you think, to find out who poisoned my sister Ruth? How, oh, how did... How did you... I, I know who you are. You're, you're a detective. Oh. I saw you with the other policeman in the park today. You well, must know. But I don't. I have no idea. I may as well admit I'm not ungrateful to whoever it was. You'll find that out, so I might as well tell you. She was very trying, was she? Well, not very. I hardly saw her, but I had cause to fear her. You see, the Palinode family is in the position of the crew of a small boat. If one member drinks all his allotted share of water, the rest must either watch him die of thirst or share. And we haven't very much to share, <laughs> even with the assistance of Herbert Boone. Is that all you're going to tell me? Yes. The rest you can find for yourself. It's not very interesting. But why? Why? I have no gifts. I cannot make or write or even tell. So, I keep busy. <laughs> you wouldn't like any more of that tea, I suppose. Morning, sir. What? Oh, oh, morning, Luke. Oh, really sent you tea, so I begged a cup for myself. Oh, thank you very much. Oh. Officially, I'm interviewing her lawyer nephew. <laughs> I don't suppose that tale's going to wear, but I suppose we may as well stick to it as long as we can. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Jessica's spotted me as a sleuth. She saw me with oats and yeo in the park. <laughs> Did she? Mm. Oh, they're not bar me, any of them. <laughs> now then, sir. What are the chances of Parwile the chemist having a basin full of hyacinth hydrobromide in his locker? Oh, small. No, my impression is that it's rarely used in medicine. Of course, it earned its reputation as a poison when Crippin tried it on Bel Elmore. Well, what is it? Henbane, I think. Really? 
What, the weed? Mm, yes, I think so. It's very common. It grows everywhere. Damn it, you could find it in the park. Yes, I suppose you could. But then you'd have to make the muck. I'd better try the dock. And then I must tackle the bank manager. Ah, I saw him briefly last night. He'd been to see Mr. Vadney. Neat little soul. That's him. Mr. Henry James. Why does that name sound familiar? <laughs> Refuses to talk about clients' finances unless subpoenaed. Miss Ruth was spending too much before she was killed. I've got that far. Of course, Yeo says money is the only respectable motive for murder. Well, none of these old dears has got any. They pay Reenie peanuts, just two or three quid a week. Mm. And Jessica only pays five bob. What? Five shillings. Really? Well, she won't eat a thing except her own boiled muck. <laughs> I don't know how Reenie does it, but she's got money. A lot of money. I hope she's not in something with Jas Bowles. That would destroy my faith in women, that would. Oh, no, I hardly think so, no. I mean, would she have dragged me down in the middle of the night to catch him if she were? <laughs> That's right. Well, shall we see the bank manager? I'd like to get there about ten o'clock. All oh, right. Oh, by the way, mm -hmm. this came over the blower last night. Housebreaker called Lukey Jeffries in Charlesfield Prison Infirmary. Delirious. Well, what on earth is Keeps that? whispering Apron Street. Don't send me up Apron Street. When he's lucid, he says he's never heard of the place. Hmm. Do I take it he's frightened? Seems so. There's a note at the end. Physician reports sweating and deep agitation. Just like old Bowles last night. He was sweating too. Look, I'll, uh, I'll get up. Dear me, this is very awkward. I told you, Inspector, the bank can give no information whatever, save under subpoena. And I hope to goodness it isn't going to come to that. I really do. Could you consider forgetting the bank for a moment? You know the Palinode family in a private capacity, don't you? Yes, I suppose I do. We'll avoid the subject of money, then. Any good? Uh, we'll have to. Uh, what do you want to know? It's only routine. Miss Ruth Palinode was murdered. Is that official? Yes, but don't publish it before the inquest is resumed and over. We're the police, you know. You want to know how well I knew her and when I last saw her. Is that it? Well... I've known her since I was a boy, and I last saw her one morning in the week she died. Oh, I've been trying to remember which, and I, I think it was the morning before the day she was taken ill. She came in here. On business? Yes. She had an account here? Not at that time. Then her account had been recently closed. Oh, how can I answer that? Gong. Now, let's get back to when you were a child. Where did you live then? Here. In this house? Oh, yes. There are living quarters over these offices. My father was the manager at that time. In due course, I went into the head office in the city, and finally, when my father died, I came here as manager. We're not a large concern as banks go, and we specialise in personal service. Most of our clients have been with us for generations. Are there many other branches? Five only. The head office is in Buttermarket. Mm, I expect you remember the Palinode family in its great days. Oh, I do. Thirty-five years ago... Before the Great War, this whole street was lined with carriages. The whole district used to revolve round the Palinodes. It was a great time, and they were very great people. The furs in church, the diamonds when Mrs. Palinode went to the theatre, the Christmas parties for those of us who were lucky enough to attend. When I came back and found them as they are now, it was a shock, a, a genuine shock. They're still very charming people. Oh, yes. One still feels... A duty to them. But, my dear sir, then... Perhaps Sir uh, Edward Palinode was not the businessman his father was? Hmm? No. Miss Jessica tells me that her weekly income is measured in shillings. Miss Jessica? I cannot discuss that. No, 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 of course not. When you saw Miss Ruth last, the day before she died, she was quite well then, was she? Oh, on the contrary... I thought she might be very ill. She was excitable, you know, very overbearing and extravagant in her demands. In fact, when I heard next day, yes, I, I'm certain it was the next day, that she'd had a stroke, I wasn't at all surprised. So you accepted the diagnosis without question? I did, I'm afraid, absolutely. I said, well, I'm not astonished. There's one weight off the shoulders of those poor people. Ah, 
I should never have seen you. I knew it. There's a person to see the inspector. We don't want him in the front office, Mr. James. I sent him out again. It's a detective. He wants you with the muse, sir. Very well. Uh, Congreve, when did Miss Ruth Palanoid last call on us? The day before she died, was it not? No. It was uh, the same day. No, no. I, I'm sure it was the day before. Thank you, Congreve. That will be all. What's going on out there? <laughs> it's our right hand neighbour, Mr. Bowles. Now, what's he been up to, eh? <laughs> Perhaps he's gone up Apron Street. Well, he can't do that, sir, because this is Apron Street. You must be a stranger if you don't know that. I'll see you out, Mr. Cabin. I'm afraid old Congreve's hearing varies. He has been with us a great many years and has certain privileges, or oh, thinks he has. I, I tell you, even money isn't what it used to be. That's pure heresy, but sometimes I believe it. Good morning. Where is it, Dice? It's not here, Mr. Luke. Go on, Mr. Bowles, tell us again. Where is the coffin you fetched out of the cellar at Portman Sir Lodge last night? At number 59, Lansbury Terrace, where we're just off to now. If I'd only known you wanted to see it, Mr. Luke, I'd have cut off me right hand rather than have used it. I'd have been obliged to oblige you. I would, really. Beautiful nature you've got, Bowles. Mm. The body is actually in it, is it? All the relatives standing round it at this very moment, I suppose. Uh, he happened to need it this morning. It happened to fit. He happened to have an accident with the one he made for a customer. He happened not to know we might be interested. You've put the words in me mouth, Sergeant. We'll just take one more look round the house, if it's not inconveniencing you. Now, that is a pity. I can't manage it, Mr Luke. Not unless we go down Lansbury Terrace at a gallop, and that might be misunderstood and cause bad feeling. But as luck will have it, I've got my brother-in-law in the kitchen. He's sitting over the fire with an heavy head. He'll be pleased to show you around and be a witness. Very well, we'll do that. <laughs> See you after the party, Bowles. You didn't ought to joke, Mr. Luke. Not on this subject. Ah, my dear Inspector. Welcome to our humble kitchen. I saw you chatting among the crows, so I wandered round the front and through the shop. Lug says they handed him a Mickey Finn last night. Oh, oh. What did they dilute it with? Uh, a Guinness and two halves of bitter, I ask you. Me? I went off. Like one of my brother-in-law's customers, and now I feel like one. <laughs> That's typical of Jas. Absolutely tip. In his own house. Yeah. Well, there's nothing here. I've staggered round the old tuppenny apeny outfit, and there's not a wax flower out of place. I don't know what the old hypocrite's up to, but whatever it is, it is something extra. Extraordinary? No. I speak English, I hope. Extra, meaning something else. Something that's nothing to do with the little bit of now it's your turn over the road. Oh, keep it quiet if you're Christians. I can hear a fly stamp this morning. Mm. Jas is up to something extra. Nothing to do with worm shoveling and nothing to do with the polynodes. Uh, we knew that, I should hope, when we got the letter from him in the first place. What he didn't realise was that my employer would make a job of it and he certainly didn't expect me to come for a brotherly stay. Luring us down here by hinting he could tell us something. Well, he could, but it's not a lot. Miss Ruth Palinode used to like to put a bob on an horse, like anybody else might. Rowley did it for her. Jas thought it was interesting because it was secret. <laughs> Ignorant persons often make that kind of mistake. Yeah. Did she ever win? Now and again. Lost in the long run, like most women do. Yes, well, that explains a lot. Money's tight. If one member of the family goes bust, the burden falls on the rest. How's that for a motive? Oh, no motive for murder is exactly first class. What is Jas up to, Lug, do you know? Not yet, Cook. Give us an hour. Shifting booze, perhaps. What gave you that idea? Oh, it crossed me mind, that's all. It's something heavy that has to be carried careful. Well, right oh, Lug. Keep your eyes open. I'll see you later. Perhaps you could join me for a spot of meatloaf in the plate layers about 12.30? Right, good. I'll see you then. Yeah, he's in a hurry. Late for a funeral, do you think? Oh, good morning. This is number 59, 
I'm afraid I'm very late. Oh, you are, sir. They've been gone over half an hour. Oh, uh, now, uh, um, which way? I mean, uh, it's down there, isn't it? Well, it, sir, it's quite a distance. You'd better take a taxi. Yes, 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 I will. Uh, tell me, they're in limousines, are they? Oh, why, well, you can't miss it, sir. It's horse carriages. Very nice and old-fashioned. There's a lot of flowers and a lot of people. And oh. you'll see Mr. John. Yes. Too. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I, um, I must hurry. Yeah. I shall know it. A great many flowers on a perfectly black coffin. Oh, no, sir. On an oak coffin, and rather light. Oh, yes. Oh, you'll know it, sir. Of course you will. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. I shall take a taxi. Thank you. Thank you. Feeling a bit better after your orgy? Very funny, I'm sure. It shouldn't have happened to a dog. And there's something else funny, too. I was just... Sorry I'm a bit late, sir. We're short-handed, what with that Greek street shooting. We've got a general call-out for the gunman, but no sign of him. Did you see who's in the bar? Clary Grace. Thick as thieves with that old blop lip from the back. Congreve? They make an unlikely pair. Mm, don't they? A lot of relationships around here are a bit unusual, if you ask me. Yeah, like the one in the chemists. Are wild? Yeah, it's a rum shop. And the old corpse behind the counter, he's not ordinary. And then, there she was. What are you talking about? Uh, that's right. Behave like an official, don't listen, and then ask. They missed something on that there island you was going to govern, I am telling you. <laughs> I went into the chemist for a pickup after my unhappy accident last night, and as I was talking to old Paragonic, in she come, Bella Musgrave. Her as used to batten on the bereaved at funerals. Oh. He give her a look, and she give him one, and then she went in the back. You sure? Yeah, it was her all right. Same black veil, same gentle eyes, full of hypocrisy. An extraordinary thing. Mm. <clears throat> She's up to something, that's certain. She might be his auntie. He's the kind of chap to have that kind of relation. But then again, she might not. Who is Bella Musgrave? Oh, it's just a small-time crook whom we once saw sent down for 18 months, selling Bibles in a questionable manner. Uh -huh. How did the doctor take your analyst's report? Oh, resigned, you know. Yes. But you remember old Miss Jessica, the gal from the park? Yes. Now, he says she's been giving the old man in the dairy cups of poppy tea for his neuralgia. The right poppy at the right time of year, and he'd have been out like a light. Could detain her on suspicion, but it sounds so balmy, doesn't it? She's not, though. Now, I've just had a session with her solicitor... She persuaded Mr. Lawrence and Miss Evadne to agree to his telling all about the family fortunes. She's anxious to assist as much as possible, well, so she says. It seems they all own shares in absolutely worthless commodities. Mr. Edward apparently had a genius for unsuccessful speculation. Nothing came up. Well, there was a rumour that brownie mines might have a spark in them, but that fizzled out too. Yeah. Evadne and Lawrence lost faith in him and kept £7,000 each. Jessica went on longer. Hmm. Edward died worth just £75 in cash and £100,000 in various shares, nominal value only. They've all willed their worthless shares to their friends, just to show that they would have done something for them if they'd been able to. That's true. Yes, Miss Ruth appears to have had a spiteful streak. She left her parcel of Brownie Mine shares to the captain to pay him back for pinching her room. Not worth anything, I suppose. Ah, a motive, you think? No, and no, I'm afraid not. Anyway, there's no reason to think that he knew in advance he was going to get them. Not much light there, is there? No, but I think I'll drop a line to Superintendent Yeo. He may be able to shed a little. Oh, by the way, friend Jass has been caught out. Yeah? Yes, the Landbury Terrace affair was a perfectly respectable oak coffin. Not... Mr. Edwards, resplendent ebony. The old perisher. <laughs> we'll get him, never you fear. Now, dear Yeo, help. There are one or two gaps at this end which need filling, if you will. 
1. Known associates of Lucky Jeffries, housebreaker, currently in Charleswood Infirmary. 2. What has Bella Musgrave been up to lately? Any recent convictions? The local chemist is on her visiting list. 3. Is there any henbane growing in Hyde Park? How easy is it to extract hyacinth from it? 4. What do you know about brownie mines? 5. What have you been looking for lately, which is A. 5 or 6 feet long, B. Distinctive in shape, C. Fragile. Silks are old masters in rolls, occur to me. But it could be some delicate or illegal piece of machinery. We only ask because we want to know. Yours, Campion. Ah, there you are. Ah, look, like, good. You can take this to the post. Not now, Cot. You're wanted at the chemist's. Mr Luke sent me. My, what's up? Can't tell you. My lips are sealed. Come on, if you're coming. Uh, this is Tornet. What have you done? Upset the arm and lesson? I ought to be shot. Struth, I could do it myself. Look at this little lot. <sighs> Who is it? Pa Wilde, the chemist. Mm. I wasn't even questioning him, really. I'd hardly begun. I met Lug outside the Thespis, and he told me he'd seen a van drive up here about four and take a packing case on board. That's right. It was heavy, and Pa gave him a hand. Two men got up in front of the van, and Bella Musgrave, in her funeral clothes, hopped in her back. Right. Didn't get a chance of a chat. They were off in double quick time, but I got a number. What shape was the packing case? Um, long and thin. I didn't see it close to. Ah. So, what did you say to Pa Wild, Luke, to drive him over the edge? I just asked about his girlfriend, and he went all coy. So I said, come off it, Pa, she's just left here with her box. What's morning Musgrave done? Taken her little black bag and left you for Jas Bowles? He began to shake. Just a minute, Mr Luke, he said. Went behind the counter, made a noise like a pheasant and went down among the bottles. I can't believe it was necessary. The hyacinth may have come from here, but I never suspected him of administering it. He was a silly, vain old chap, not the size for anything big. Well, perhaps it wasn't so much what he'd done as what he knew. Did you recognise either of the two men in the van, Lug? You know, one of them was a perfect stranger that I know. But the other one looked like the ghost of Peter George Jelf. Reunion. That's what it is, cock. Who's Jelf? Ah, well, the Fuller gang was before your time, I fancy. Late twenties. Remarkably unchoosy. Jelf was the third in command. I had Melly Factor. Them was the judge's words, not mine. <laughs> Anyway, Gov, they'd all been upstairs. A room with nothing in it but two hard chairs facing each other. An armchair, what Jass had sat in. Must have been him. Great fat dent in the cushion. And the smell of them little whiffsy smokes. Oh, he'd been there, and I'd take my oath on it. Two chairs, eh? Yeah. It's very suggestive. The question is, what does he put in it? Eh? Put in what? The box which rests on the chair. Mr. Campion, this is a treat, this is. Ah, we're alone, Mr. Bowles. Yes, I, I thought the boy was here in the kitchen, but he's gone back to his work. <laughs> Maggers is away. As soon as there was that tragedy over the road, he came hurrying in, said goodbye, and we haven't heard of him since. Uh, would you sit here, sir, on my right, uh, so I can hear you better? Oh, ah. oh, it's a very shocking thing, poor Wild. He wasn't a friend of ours exactly, but we were very close, nodding acquaintances, as one might say. I didn't go to the inquest, but I sent Rowley out of respect. Oh. Um, Suicide when the balance of mind was disturbed, they brought in. Well, that's always the kindest way. Mm. We're putting him down tomorrow morning. I don't suppose there'll be a penny to come, but we shall do him with as much luxury as if we were waiting on you yourself. I wanted to ask you why you bothered to send for me. I, sir? I sent for you? Oh, you're making a big mistake there, sir. I didn't know such thing. I'm glad to see you here, Mr Campion, because I want the whole thing cleared up, and that's a fact, but no, sir. I 
didn't send for you, sir. I can see that a police inquiry wouldn't be very good for your trade. No, sir. No, the publicity can't be helpful. And I realise that you knew that Miss Ruth Palinode was in the habit of putting an occasional shilling or two on a horse. Ah. But I don't think that point was strong enough to make you send for me. Uh, <laughs> no, Mr. Uh, I didn't send for you, Mr. Campin, but... Uh, Trade is trade, and the police are the first to forget it. I do allow that. Now, there is a little something that perhaps I ought to mention. I only saw one thing that was really curious when Miss Ruth Palino died. It, it was a very, a very small thing. May not have had any significance, but it made me think. I saw Mr Lawrence Palino washing up. Really? When was this? Tea time. Nearly five. Miss Roper sent Mr Grace over. I went up alone, all quiet and respectful, for we do tread as light as we can. I hesitated in the doorway, and uh, there he was, washing up. Mr Lawrence Palinode? Yes, sir. In Miss Ruth's bedroom? Yes. There was the dead lady covered with a sheet, and there was her brother, uh, cool but nervous, if I make myself plain. With every mortal cup or glass or spoon the room contained out on the old-fashioned washstand, he was dipping the last one into the jug as I came in. <laughs> it was quite open. Hmm. Is that all? The whole truth, sir. I thought it was significant. Have you told anybody else? No one. Well, it's, it's some time ago, and it's only my word against his, isn't it? <laughs> hmm. uh, could I... Offer you a glass of anything? Mr. Luke says I drink embalming fluid. <laughs> That's only his idea of fun. No, thank you. I'm just going. Uh, uh, oh, um, oh, must you? Oh, let me show you out, sir. It's been an honour to have you in our humble home, Mr. Campion. Oh, there you are, dear. You managed to get round the crowd all right. That's right, Ducky. Oh, people are so gruesome, aren't they? <laughs> oh, some of them are reporters, of course. They've gone off the Greek Street shooting now that there's been another death in Apron Street. Yes, the vultures will gather. Mm. They weren't interested in me, I'm glad to say, although the captain and Mr Lawrence were having some difficulty getting through. What, together? Mm. Oh, oh, oh. oh, they must have made it up then. Oh, they were having such a row earlier on. But Mr Lawrence is never angry for long, bless him. I should have thought the captain's resentment would have died with Miss Ruth. Oh, yes, Ducky, that's all right. It sounded as though they were arguing about those horrible letters the doctor keeps getting. Oh, everybody seems so scratchy nowadays. And Clary's angry with me, too. He says I give the family more than they pay for. Well, what if I do? I can afford it. <laughs> I won't have him trying to pump old Congreve about my bank account. It is not his business. Of course not, Auntie. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Al, but I do get wound up. I think I know why you do it. I was looking at Professor Palinode's portrait in the dining room this morning. Ah, oh, were you, dear? Hmm. Well, don't be too clever, will you? As you like. Oh, well, by the way, you've got a visitor. Now, he seems quite anxious not to meet anyone, so I've put him in your room. Name of Glossop, I think he said. Glossop? Mm hmm Well, the only Glossop I know is the financial advisor to the Treasury. Oh, la-di-da. <laughs> I've only met him once or twice. Well, I don't know, Ducky, I'm sure. You'd better go up and see, hadn't you? Mm -hmm. But don't be late for supper now. All right, Auntie, I'll be good. Thank you so much. I'm so unpractical with electrical things. Yeah, 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 yeah. You must come to my theatrical conversazione tomorrow. <laughs> Just after six. Don't be late. I get too tired to talk rather soon. Yeah. Oh, you're out a lot. <laughs> ah, Sir William. I hope you've not been waiting long. Extraordinary woman. Hmm? Uh, seemed to take me for an actor. Oh, really? <laughs> Made me mend an electric kettle. Yes, yes. Well, she's good at getting people to do things for her. Is she your murderess? Um, a runner-up. Mm. I've been talking to Stanislaus Oates, or rather, he's been talking to me. You put a query to Superintendent Yeo. Alarm bells rang. 
That is why I'm here. Ah. Only four reliable people are involved, so that should be all right. Now, Campion, what exactly do you know about Brownie Mines? Oh, almost nothing. A woman who's been murdered held a number of shares. They're thought to be worthless. Some months ago, there was a rumour about them. It, it was thoroughly squashed. Now, I'm not going to commit myself, because the fewer people who know about it, the better. But I'll tell you this much. Three derelict gold mines, I won't say where, of course, mm. are suspected of yielding a certain metal of great scarcity, which is in demand for the manufacture of certain items vital for this country's defence. It's now being investigated. Secrecy is absolutely vital. Oh. I tell you, if some fellow has murdered to get hold of that script, then he's a crook. Hmm. A faultless chap all round. Very well. We will know nothing here. Save that there is a motive in the stuff. Hmm? Excellent. Yeah. Uh, keep me posted. And you haven't seen me. Uh, oh, of course, Sir William. Uh, was it dark when you came in? Hmm? Ah, not quite. Uh, a pity, since I was so anxious we should not be seen together, that I took the trouble to find you, instead of fixing a meeting at the club or in the office. But I don't think I was recognised. I'm hardly a public figure. No, no, still, it, it would perhaps be as well if you could go down through the basement kitchen. Basement? Well, you see, that way you can avoid the hordes on the Hordes? Front step. Uh, no, no, uh, no, you can rely on Miss Roper's discretion. Uh, 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 thank you. Uh, I'll do that. Uh, goodbye, Captain. Goodbye. <sighs> Dear Amanda... I expect you to receive my other letter by now. I don't know how much longer I shall be away. We're still largely in the dark, though I have great confidence in Charlie Luke. It's rather like working with a human dynamo. He's very young for the job, but he will go far, I'm certain. He never lets go, you see, the best quality for a detective to have. My best love to Sexton Blake, Jr., and to you, as always, Albert. It's only beer. Ah, Luke. What a country. You drink pretty, I'll have a bottle. <laughs> oh, what a day. No go with Edward. Looks like natural causes. Greeno's been reported in France. He's one of the Greek street bear. Mm. The other one has vanished into thin air. I've got a couple of chaps going over par wild stock. Nothing there so far. Oh, and the docks had another poison letter. Oh. You can read it. Here. Oh, thank you. Oh, dear, oh, dear. You blank, 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 etc., etc. Oh, hmm. well, you could have spared him that. Blank, 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 dear me. Glass tells all, don't forget. Hmm. Burning hell? Quite a little viper, isn't she? It is she, I suppose. Oh, yes, hmm. no doubt about it. We've had the shrinks on it. Well, what it all seems to boil down to is, uh... Yes, here we are. The brother is the one who's being clever. He's got what she left to the captain, who is a poor fool. Hmm. Fascinating, if true. How come? Because Miss Ruth's legacy to the captain, whom she disliked, was 8,000 preference negotiable shares in a deadly secret. Sit down and listen to me break a confidence... And then I think we must have a word with Lawrence. Forensic medicine, toxicology, mental abnormality and crime. Good Lord, quite a library. Lawrence Palinode becomes more interesting. Chase me. Found now feeder again, look. What? All by itself on the mantelpiece. Envelope as well. Addressed to Lawrence? Uh, yes. Postmarked yesterday. May I, um... Well, worse and worse. She must be mad. Seems to want to insist, though. You have robbed a fool. We didn't go over this room when we interviewed him before. No. I may as well admit I didn't understand a quarter of what he said last time. He takes me to the fair every time he opens his mouth. But why hasn't he reported this? Looks damn funny to me. Well, you can ask him now. Did you seek permission to come in here? I see you have a letter of mine. May I have it? 
Do you mean you wrote it? I? <laughs> In moments of aberration, I suppose. It's an interesting theory, but hardly tenable. I have seen another like it addressed to the doctor. It is the same handwriting. It's a woman, you know. Well, probably you don't find that as shattering as I do. Are all these library books? Most of them. I wish to read up on the subject when I read the first anonymous letter. You see, someone on the inside must have written them. She knows so much about us. What made you so sure your sister Ruth had committed suicide? You are remarkably well informed. You washed up every cup and glass, you see. Had it been only one, we might have been forgiven for arriving at a different conclusion. Uh, the undertaker saw me, I suppose. Ruth was extravagant and had mortgaged her little income. Hick Vibimus, Ambitiosa, Porporate. Evadne and I taxed her with it. She went to bed very upset and died the next day. When it occurred to me that she must have poisoned herself, I rinsed the vessels in her room because, I suppose, I didn't want anyone else to pick up anything dangerous by mistake. Where did you get the poison? That really is something for you to find out. The sedge is withered. I know nothing of any details. Ruth had a faulty mathematical streak. She had an absurd system, you know. I worked it out afterwards and found it completely unsound. Why do you think someone inside the house wrote the letters? Anyone could have told tales to a friend in the meat kitchen. It must be someone sympathetic to the captain. The letters accuse me of robbing him, which is ridiculous. I gave him five pounds, a lot of money for the shares. They were quite worthless, and my sister Ruth left them to Seaton to annoy him, since he is so notoriously short of money. He's not one of the family, and I felt it my duty to see he was not victimised. It was very tasteless of Ruth. Would you sell them again for a fiver? Oh, certainly not. I should never sell them. Well, have you finished your interrogation, Inspector? OK, for the moment. You'll remain in the house, won't you, Mr. Pallinold? Oh. Shall we go up, sir? Well, off to plague Seaton now, no doubt. Uh, close the door behind you, if you please. Mm. It's no use. The captain's had it. Oh. Must have drunk the whole bottle. <laughs> One way of avoiding questioning. Mm. You'll have to sleep it off before we get a peep out of him. Well, here's a letter to you from the super. Ah, good. And a pile of memos for me. Nothing on Pa Wild, except that he was in debt all round. Doctor's report says undernourished. Suggests blackmail, I suppose. Could have done anything in his time. He was a chemist, wasn't he? Well, Yeo says Bella Musgrave hasn't stepped over the edge for years. Lucky Jeffries died without saying any more. And an amateur couldn't make Heising from Henbane. Mm. My chaps have turned over Bow's shop and found not a thing out of place, except that he was sweating profusely. Just as he was when I went and asked why he'd sent for me. Oh, he denied it, by the way. Couldn't get rid of me fast enough. <laughs> and I just caught a glimpse of old Congreve from the bank, hidden in the corner as I left. A pile of justice as well, eh? Mm. Needs watching, that one. No sign of an import order for a body or anything. None. He says there's no call for it nowadays. He's got a nice team of horses, though. You've seen those. And a thing called a coffin break. Like a cigar box on wheels. Nice high box seat for the driver. Must be the last one in the country. Mm. Uh, I think I go home. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Ruth has been poisoned. Pa Wild has done himself in. The captain has put himself out. Jas is innocent but sweating. And we're just exactly where we always were. <laughs> Don't even know who wrote the filthy letters. Oh, now, do you know I've had a thought about that? That other letter to the doctor said, Glass tells all, don't forget. You got any fortune tellers on your patch? I ought to resign on this. Glass sometimes means crystal ball. Mm. And the captain is perhaps vain enough to amuse himself with a few superstitious fancies. And think? unwittingly give out information about the family at the same time? Yes. Of course. She calls herself Pharaoh's daughter and gives readings for a tanner a time. Lives in a little dark street. Real name... Oh, God almighty. Miss Congreve. What... Damn it, Campion, she must be that old blob lit from the bank's sister. I say, footlights, very pretty. Candles, courtesy of Rini. Not that Miss Evadne has noticed. The soiree's upstairs. Shall I announce you? Formal, is it? No, no, I don't. Let's just go up. I'm not invited. I shall be in the kitchen. 
How did you get on with the dusky lady? Pharaoh's daughter? Confess at five this morning. Did it all for the captain. Grievance against the dock. He'd snubbed her sometime. She's crying all over the cells. Congreve slipped out the back way just as we got there, but we've got a call out. Oh, Albert, there you are. Oh, hello, dear. Oh, isn't it awful about my captain? Fancy him having his fortune told by a... Oh, well, I'm, I want to mean myself, ducky. <laughs> He says he didn't even guess it was her until she admitted it and threatened to post one to Lawrence. When he found out she had, he sneaked upstairs in a blue funk and put himself out with a bottle I didn't even know he had. Oh, I could kill him. I really could. <laughs> what are you doing here? Standing guard to see he doesn't get out? No, to warn my friends not to drink anything, especially the yellow stuff in the glasses. She makes it with ground salt and it oh. has a very funny effect. Oh, no. When you've had enough uplift, dear, come down to the basement. Carrie's got a bit of a bar going. <laughs> oh, and by the way, Mr. Lugg's come back. He's waiting in your room. Oh, right. No, I've never done that. Oh, oh, you Hello. Care for a baked meat? What are you doing, exactly? Helping cock. Oh. I come round looking for you, and the old girl with a voice like a beak persuaded me to hand around. Funny muck I'm pushing out, but I've took a fancy to her. Mrs. Vadney? The older Miss P, yes. A lovely woman. Did you find out anything? No, not a lot. Apron Street used to be a joke until about a year ago, and now no one mentions it anymore. Only bloke I could hear of who actually said he was going up Apron Street was a finger called Ed Geddy. And he ain't been seen since. Geddy? Hmm. Oh, the girl in the kiosk murder, Geddy? That's the one. Got clean away. Anything else? I looked up Peter George Jelf and his little lorry. Looks quite respectable. Got a two-man haulage business in Fletcher's town. Ah, piece of resistance I've kept till last. The coffin's back. What? Started you, eh? Did me. I peeked through Jazzy's shed window, and there it was, packed flat. Do you mean it had hinges? Might have had, didn't see. It was the right one, all right. Black as a piano and as much gold on it as a Kushner's trousers. Well, let's get back to the blowout. Now, make up your mind what you're going to have. A cup of yerba mat or a small nettle oh, pot? Mm -hmm. no. Yes, there's a ration of something else as well. Mm. Smells as if it come out with the flowers in the oil. There's not a lot of call for that. Good evening, Mr. Campion. Nice to see you. Oh, good evening, Doctor. Uh, nice party. Uh, yes. Uh, is your colleague about? No, no, no. I don't think he... Oh, it's you. Oh. Isn't this wonderful? I put a poultice on the grocer's knee and it's done him good. The doctor admits it, don't you, Doctor? Oh, uh, well, uh, oh. Excuse me. Oh. No, no, it has very little grace. He can't see, you see. But, but Doctor, you do admit, don't you? <laughs> oh, here you are. I'm so pleased to see you. Ah, good evening, Miss Ballinger. So great a number of people. <laughs> it's certainly a larger gathering than usual. Good evening, Mr. Campion. Mr. James? So, uh, you didn't bring your nice friend, Sir William Glossop, after all. Uh, is that the Glossop of the PAO Trust? A most brilliant man. Was he here? Oh, excuse me. Oh, I, uh... yes. Uh, he was waiting for this clever man and did me a little service. He did not introduce himself, but he left his hat on a chair and I read his name in it. I'm very long sighted, you know. Adrian? Adrian, are you thinking of reciting for us? Oh, I thought that was to be a treat for next time. I do hope so, for I really must not stay today. Uh, a most enjoyable evening, uh, Miss Palladin. Uh, uh, good night. Good night. Good night. Well, oh, don't let that put you <laughs> off, Adrian. Hardly a mind. You wanted, Cock. What? Something's happened to Mr. Lawrence. Miss Roper says he's died. <sighs> oh, poor old chap. Never mind, you're all right now, Ducky. Well, how much longer have you got to go on bothering him, Mr. Luke? He had something quite different from the others, Campion. A oh. different colour, a different stink, did he? I don't want to commit myself, Luke, but I think it was something more than a purely herbal poison. The Tassin probably saved his life by making him vomit, but I think he had something more. 
Someone is trying to make it look like my sister Jessica. There was a scrap of leaf in my glass. It was hemlock, classic poison. I recognised it as soon as I hooked it out. Someone is trying to suggest that Jessica poisoned Ruth and Edward, but she wouldn't be so crude. No one but his maker killed your brother Edward. Mm. He had a stroke. Uh, I did the Babinski test. It's infallible. Uh, will you see Miss Jessica now? Mm. And Superintendent Yeo's arrived. They're in the dining room. Come along then, sir. Look after Lawrence, Sweeney. Oh. Good evening, sir. What have you got, Luke? Something has disagreed with Lawrence. Did you know? Yes. I did not make a mistake. I made a grey nettle drink, and the tansy was yellow. They tell me the stuff Lawrence drank was a deep bottle green. Mm, with leaves in it. Really? Oh, well, then it could not have been mine. I strain everything most carefully, and I'm very fond of Lawrence. You are very alike, aren't you? You both so much resemble your father's portrait. And so, oddly, does Miss Roper. So you know. Yes, her mother danced, I believe. Mm. Of course, my father was a just man and provided handsomely for them. Because we are so impractical, he left Rini all his house property, which is why we accept so much from her. Please, please be very discreet. You see, she does not know that we know. That way there is no embarrassment on either side. Mm. Oh, I Inspector... Is that the glass Lawrence drank from? Do be very careful with it. It is one of Evadne's cherries. She has only two left. They are old Bristol. Ah, I saw them in her room the first night I came. She must have been entertaining Mr. James in the time-honoured manner. Oh, yes, we always give the bank manager a glass of sherry. Always? Yes. And does the bank reciprocate when you go there? Invariably. Lord, what fools! Luke, come on. Yes, Captain. You too, Yale. Yeah. Captain. I hope your net hasn't any holes in it. I'm not going in without a search warrant, I warn you, Campion. Funny, there must be someone there, night watchman, somebody. Yes. It's been a call after him all day, but no sign. I'm trusting you, Campion. What on earth? Now what's happened? Okay! It's Locke. He's gone in through the window in a shower of glass. Oh, damn it, he's a burglar, isn't he? He'll get the door open, hop it, and we'll rush in and protect the property. Don't oh, listen. What the hell's that? <laughs> it's Jass. He saved us. He's going up Apron Street before our very eyes. Can we get a car? Can do. I hope you know what you're doing, Campion. Hope on, Governor. Car Q23 calling all cars. Chief Inspector Luke. I'm pursuing black horse-drawn vehicle with single passenger driver. Technical name, Coffin Break. Repeat, Coffin Break. Last seen, Barrel Road West, proceeding north. Inform all call points. Over. It's imperative we get to him before he stops. If you say so. Where's he going? I think to Fletcher's town. Peter George Jelf has a haulage business there. Jelf? Yes. That's a coincidence. One of my men ran into him by chance on Euston Station yesterday. What? Well, it looked legit, but he glanced into the van out of force of habit, and the only thing he had aboard was a packing case marked Conjurer's Stores. Ah, so that's it. I wondered how they got the coffin back. Back? He's shifting. It's round the park already. Down here, driver. We'll cut him off. Damn it, we've lost him. I'd have sworn he had to come this way. Let me out. He won't risk going on. He'll unload. He'll get away with it. Central Control calling car Q23. Message for Chief Inspector Luke. Attention, Joseph Congreve, 51B, Terry Street West found dangerously ill following murderous attack. Locked in cupboard, upstairs room, Apron Street branch, Clash Bank, over. Apron Street. He's in Apron Street. What in hell are we doing here? Listen. Quick, block the road. Oh. Oh, Mr. Luke, your 
car hasn't broken down, I hope. Get down, Bowles. Certainly, Mr. Luke, sir, but uh, I'm on my lawful... Account. Tell it all at the station. Get down. As you say, Mr. Luke. <clears throat> but this isn't like you. Can any of you gentlemen drive? The mare's not quite like a motor. Don't worry about that. I'll bring your horse myself. Get in the car. Very good, sir. I'm in your hands. Uh, shall I go first, Mr. Luke? Open it up, Bowles. Dad, uh, open it, Mr. Luke. I hardly expected this, sir. Get on with it. Got a screwdriver? Of course. Uh, very well. Stand back, gentlemen, if you please. The gentleman died of a bad trouble. There's no need for you to run any risk. Uh, we are used to it, of course. There you are, sir. Hope you're satisfied. It's not really very nice. Wait. Died, I think you said. Good Lord. Mm. What a rig. <laughs> mm. Doped, but still alive. Oh, yes. They were all alive, of course. That was the object of the exercise. Greener, your Greek street bird, was the one before this. What is it, an escape outfit? Yes, rather a good one. Awfully well done. Courtesy, sympathy, comfort in transit, in fact. They go to Ireland like this, with a mourner laid on to weep them through the customs. Bella Musgrave, no less. I'll be... who is doing it all? Him? No, no. That's a boss in the coffin. A genius in his way, but hopeless at murder. How he managed to kill Miss Ruth successfully, I really don't know. Champion, there's no way to give evidence. What's the first thing, man? Sorry, sir. His name is Henry James. He's the manager of the Apron Street branch of Clough's Back. Well, that's more like it. Now we're getting somewhere. What have you got to say for yourself, Bowles? It was done out of kindness. Put that down in writing and never let it be forgot. Hunted animals. That's how I saw them. And that's how I saw him in the finish. You couldn't understand him because you don't know April Street. It was changing and he wouldn't have it. He tried to uh, stop the clock. I sympathise with that, but he didn't ought to have turned to murder. Couldn't bring myself to believe it of him, not at first. Yet you did, you know. Because after you'd made the mistake of asking your brother-in-law to investigate, you were terrified that James should find out you'd done so, hmm? Ah. You noticed old Congreve in my kitchen that night, did you? Oh, yeah. You're very sharp, Mr Campion, I'll say that. <laughs> He came round nosing and asking funny questions. And I wasn't sure if he was doing it for James or not, so I wasn't going to speak in front of him. Uh, though, in fact, James never trusted him. Seems to have planned a cosy retirement if the contents of that thing are anything to go by. Is there anything else we want from Bowles at the moment, Campion? Um, uh, well, there's always Ed Geddy. Geddy? Kill the poor little girl who couldn't have blacked his eye for him. Mm. Uh, did he get away in this conjuring cabinet too? Got away but didn't quite arrive. It was Ed Geddy who gave Apron Street its bad name among the fraternity. Either the drug was too powerful, the coffin too tight, or the journey too long. Ed died at the box. In view of the line he took when he thought Luke was going to raise the subject, Pa Wilde must have dispensed the drug. It'll be a question of proof, sir, won't it? If it's true. <laughs> Well, I think that's about it. The only query is how James knew Miss Ruth's shares in Brownie Mines were going to be worth something after all. It's just one of those top-secret leaks in financial circles, I suppose. But she had told him she'd left them to him in her will, and he did have the opportunity to do her in almost daily, because every time the Palinodes saw their bank manager, at home or in his office, they drank a glass of sherry together. Get away. No, Banks done that for 50 years. Aha, uh -huh, except this one. Of course, I should have realised sooner. It was Lawrence's green sherry glass this evening that switched on the light. I didn't realise James had inherited the shares. No, he didn't. No, she'd already changed her will, so it was all for nothing. Oh. Except that he got Lawrence to buy them from the captain, hoping to take them over as security for a small personal loan. Well, that's my bet. And then he thought to clean up the whole thing by polishing off Lawrence and throwing the blame for both murders onto Jessica but I don't know where he got the stuff from. Uh, I, I believe I can throw some light there, sir. Yes, Dice. We got it out of old Congreve in hospital. James didn't have to get the hyacinth. It was there, in the corner cupboard of his office, right beside the sherry and the glasses, in a sealed glass box marked 
poison. Ah. It had been there as a curiosity ever since the days of Crippin. Lots of people took a morbid interest about it at the time. Congreve had worked in the bank so long, he always knew about it and noticed when it wasn't there anymore and told his sister. When they read about Miss Ruth's symptoms, they put two and two together. They were proposing to blackmail James over it. Wasn't that cupboard ever cleared out? We've had two wars since Crippen was hanged. Cleaned, but not cleared, sir. It's like a drawing room piece when you get the door open, full of what you might call relics. The whole place is a bit like that. Yeah. We found all the relevant papers in an antique wine cooler in his bedroom. We shall trace all his associates. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Very neatly wrapped up. <laughs> I didn't think you were going to get out of this one, Campion. Your praise is our reward. Ah, uh, now, if you'll excuse me, it is past my bedtime. Good night, Luke. Call on me any time. Oh, I will. Next time you'll get a wire, if not an escort. Good night, and thanks. Oh, oh and a about time, too, Ducky. <laughs> oh. oh, you are a wonderful man. Yeah. <laughs> Look, here's a letter for you, dear. Oh, thank you. It came yesterday morning, and nobody thought to give it to you. Mm. <laughs> Come into the kitchen, Ducky, and have some coffee. Oh. Clary and Mr. Lug have had a bottle or two, but you're not to be angry with them. Well, it's the relief. <laughs> Dear Albert, thank you for letting me know that we're not going to govern that island. I'm so glad. I've been following your case as well as I can from the newspapers, but the reports are very sketchy, I'm afraid, and I fear that any comment I might make would be so wide of the mark as to be irritating. I hope we see you very soon. Lots of love, Amanda. P.S. I can't help it. Have you thought of the bank manager? So shady. More work for The Undertaker was dramatised for radio by Margaret Etor from the novel by Marjorie Allingham with Francis Matthews as Albert Campion, Geoffrey Matthews as Lug, and Tim Meats as Detective Inspector Luke. Others in the cast, Runny Roper, Jennifer Piercy, Jas Bowles, George Parsons, Jessica, Rachel Gurney, Evadne, Sheila Grant, Lawrence and Dice, Manning Wilson, James and Glossop, Philip Manicum, Clarence and Captain Seaton, Howard Gorney, Dr. Smith and Yao, Paul Nicholson, and Congreve, Stuart Organ. Other parts were played by James Good and Stuart Organ. The programme was directed in Bristol by Brian Miller. This is the BBC Home Service and the British Forces Network in Germany. We present Barry Foster and Derek Bond in Torment, a radio play by Philip Levine. Torment. Oh, Flora, have you seen Ralph? He went out, Mrs. Ellinger. Did he say where? <laughs> no, never does these days. He mm. used to be such a sociable creature. Now I'm lucky if he says hello or good morning. Oh, young people. You haven't forgotten Mr. Ellinger and I will be out this evening. No, he did mention something about it last night. It's your anniversary, I gather. Yes, we're driving into Norwich for the evening. Oh, that should be nice. Oh, nothing spectacular, just dinner at the Star Hotel. How long ago did Ralph leave? Oh, must be at least half an hour. He drove up towards the cliffs. Oh? From what I hear, he's always up there. About the evening meal, you better lay on something cold for Ralph in case he's late. Yes, that's what I had in mind. Oh, Brenda, my feet are killing me. Oh, me too. Ooh. Oh, I think I've got a blister on my heel. I wish we'd have stopped at Great Yarmouth. Oh, well, don't blame me, Daff. You were the one who wanted a hike to Cromer. How far is it on to the next place? Have you got the map? Yeah. It's Wintersley. Uh, 
Well, that's about five miles. Oh, I'd give anything for a lift. Oh, it looks as though your prayers have been answered. There's a car coming down the cliff road. <laughs> it's a bit tatty, isn't <laughs> well, it? Well, thank heavens for small mercy. <laughs> I will, if it stops. Oh, there's a young bloke driving. Mm, nice looking, too. I wonder if he prefers blondes or redheads. He can take his choice. <laughs> if we can't make him stop, we ought to give up. <laughs> Just you watch this. Hey! Hello! Hello. Uh, are you going as far as Wintersley? What do you want? Oh, a lift to Wintersley, if you could manage it. We'd, we'd be ever so grateful. Well, uh, Well, there's only the two of us, me and my friend. Oh, here she is now. What? No. No, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't. What? But it's not very far. Let go of the door. Oh. Well, well, what happened, Brenda? I don't know. He took one look at you and slammed the door. Do you know him? Oh, no. I've never seen him before. He was a bit het up, wasn't he? Het up? I'd say he was round the bend. Excuse me. Yes? There's a police station around here somewhere, isn't there? In there, turning opposite. Yeah. On the other side of the road. Oh, oh, well. You might say thank you, young man. Oh, uh, Constable Bartley. Ah? Have you filed away those charge sheets? Oh, just done the last of them, Sergeant. Now, what about that accident to Hemsby? Has the cyclist been in? Oh, yes, I got uh, a statement. Can I... It was a pedestrian's fault. No doubt about that. Yes, I thought as much. Um, oh, look, there's uh, someone at the counter. See where they want them. Uh, yes, sir. Afternoon, sir. Can I help you? Yes, I want... Uh, I'd like... Look, is there a senior officer I could talk to? What's it about exactly, sir? I'm sorry, it's difficult to explain. I, I'd like to talk to a senior officer, if I may. Oh. Oh, well, just hang on, will you? Yes. Yes, sir. Yep. That young bloke wants to talk to a senior officer. You handle it. Well, what's he want? Well, he won't say. Oh, all right. Let me have that cyclist statement as soon as you can, will you? Yes, sir. No, sir. What can I do for you? No, look, this isn't easy. I've, 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 I've come to give myself up. Oh? And for what, may I ask? Well, I, I don't know how to... Well, you see, it, it all happened nearly a year ago. I killed someone. A girl. You did what? I killed a girl. Well, what do you mean? By accident? No. Well, where is she? I don't know. You don't know? I threw her body into the sea. Whereabouts? Off the cliffs, a few miles from here. Ah. Oh. I see. Well, what do I do? Just stand here? Aren't you going to take me into custody? For the moment, just come round this side the counter, will you? And uh, through here. That's the way. Now, just wait in there, will you? I'll be with you in a minute. All right. Did he say he killed a girl, son? Don't bother me now, Bartley. Oh, must be off his head. I read about cases like that in the police gazette. Just get on with that report, there's a good lad. Ah, oh, yes, son. Hello, CID office. Is Inspector Hadley there? Sergeant Lumsden here. I'll get him for me, would you? It's important. Uh, here's a safe, son. Uh, drop it in the tray. That's it. Hello? Inspector Adley? I'm sorry to trouble you, sir, but I got a young bloke down here in the interview room. He marched in here not five minutes ago and, uh, well, prepare yourself for a shock. He says he killed a girl. Yes, you heard right. A girl. No, about a year ago. <laughs> well, I wouldn't have thought so, sir. He, he is a bit on edge, but I wouldn't have said he was a nutcase. Fine, sir. I'll do that right away. Bartley. Uh, that's our statement form. Yeah, sir. Ah. Oh, Inspector Adley should be down in a sec. Oh. Um. Yes, yes, it's uh, it's all right, son. If you want to smoke, go ahead. Like one? No, not for me, thanks. So far, I managed to lay off. Just uh, grab a chair, will you? That's the way. That's it. Now... First, let's have your name. Ralph Ellinger. 
You mind spelling that? E double L I N G E R. G E R I got. Ellinger, now your your age? Twenty two. Occupation? I'm doing nothing at the moment. I was a student. Law. Law. I see. Oh, uh, law inspector. Sergeant. Now, uh, that's as far as I got with a statement, sir. Thank you, Sergeant. Um, should I buzz off, sir? No, no, no. I'd like you to stay, if you will. Very good, sir. Ralph Ellinger. Yes. Hmm. Well, now... What's all this about, Mr. Ellinger? Well, I've already made a statement to the sergeant. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like you to repeat it for my benefit. About a year ago, I killed a girl. I've come to give myself up. You've left it a little late, haven't you? Well, does that make any difference? I'm here now. Oh, oh my head, it's splitting. Oh. Would you like some water? No, I... no, 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 thanks. I'm, I'm all right. Oh. Well, sit down, will you, Mr. Ellinger? <laughs> now then. This girl you say you killed, who was she? Local girl? No. Well, what was her name? Her name? Yes, her name. Peggy. Peggy who? I don't know. You don't know? No, I'd only just met her. I, I picked her up one night in the car. Where? On the road from Norwich. Is it a habit of yours to pick up girls late at night? No, of course not. Well, if she wasn't a local girl, where did she come from? Ireland. Ireland. Yes, she'd come over here to work during the summer. Where? Oh, some hotel, the Queen's in Yarmouth. See, you've got that, Sergeant. Sir. What was she doing on the Norwich Road? <sighs> Hitchhiking from Liverpool. Well, Yarmouth was a, a little out of my way, but I said I'd give her a lift. Go on. Well, we stopped off at a pub for a drink, and we got quite pally. A couple of gins, and you'd thought I'm, we'd known each other for years. After we left the pub, we mm, chatted for a bit. And then a few miles from Yarmouth, she let me kiss her. And then, well, I, I really can't explain it. I had my arms around her, but I, I, I couldn't let her go. Mm. She became frightened and started to struggle. And the next thing I remember, my hands were around her throat and I felt my fingers tightening. Well, I, I knew what I was doing, but for some reason I couldn't stop. And suddenly she was quite still and... I knew she was dead. I, I must have sat there for about an hour. And then I, I drove up to the other side of Winsersley and threw her body over the cliffs. I watched the newspapers like a hawk, but there wasn't a word. At first I tried to push it into the back of my mind and pretend it didn't happen, that it was a, a, a bad dream. Are you sure it wasn't? Of course I'm sure. For heaven's sake. I killed that girl. That Look, there's no doubt in my mind. I killed her, believe me. For a time, I thought I could live with it, but now I, I, well, I can't sleep or, or work, and it's become unbearable. The girl's face never leaves me. Describe her. Oh, green eyes, pretty red hair, a gentle voice. Sweet kid, 19, 20, no more. Well, this could be a very serious matter. You realise that, don't you, Mr. Ellinger? Of course, but I had to come here. I don't care what happens to me. Well, for the moment, just let's stick to the fact, shall we? When did this happen, exactly? It was at the end of June last year, the 27th. Mm -hmm. I came down from Cambridge for the summer vac, and when I got home, the house was empty. My father was abroad. What, on business? No, on holiday with my stepmother. I see. Well, I was a bit depressed, to tell the truth. So I drove into Norwich for the evening. I took in a film. Then I picked up this girl on the way back. What part of Ireland did she come from? What? Um, she didn't say. Hmm. Well, what did you talk about? Oh, well, all sorts of things. She, she'd left home and, and had no intention of going back. She was hoping to settle down here. Now, how was she dressed? A light coat with uh, large buttons down the front. Any hat? No, no hat. And, oh, well, everything else seems pretty hazy. Hmm. Well, just stay where you are, Mr. Ellinger, will you? What? i be back with you in a moment. Oh, all right. Sergeant. Sir? Tell me, Sergeant. Sir? Have there been any reports of a girl's body being washed up in the past year? Well, no, sir. 
Not to my knowledge. In fact, I'm pretty sure there aren't. Hmm. What, uh, what do you make of him, sir? You think he is a nutcase? No, I wouldn't have thought so. He's, he's a bit nervy, but he's rational. Yes. But whether he's all there or not, well, we shall have to follow up. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to check the missing persons list and the police gazette for a description of this girl. Sir. Then call the headquarters at Norwich. I'll take the boy's written statement. Right, sir. Hmm. Now, Mr. Ellinger, I'll have to go over that again, if you don't mind. So I shall need your signed statement. You can dictate it to me, and I'll write it down. But first, let's have your address. Hillside House. Hillside House. Riders Lane. Riders Lane. Wintersley. Winter. Miss Sanford? Miss Sanford? Yes? Hello, don't you recognize me? I'm Frank Ellinger, Ralph's father. Oh, uh, hello. <laughs> well, we only met once briefly. Where are you off to? The library. I, I work there. Can I give you a lift? Oh, no, I couldn't think of bothering you. Oh, it's no bother. Climb in. It's uh, somewhere on the right, isn't it? The fourth. I, I could have walked. It's no distance at all. <laughs> Too late now. <laughs> Uh, have you seen Ralph lately? No, not for some time. Uh, your father's in timber, isn't he? Yes. Sound. Well, you must tell Ralph I've seen you. No, please don't do that. Well, why not? I I'd rather you didn't. Uh, if you could drop me on the next corner, uh, th that'll do fine. Right you are. Thank you, Mr. Ellinger. My pleasure. Hello, darling. Frank, you managed to get off early. Well, a promise is a promise. What have you got there? Uh, where? Come on, show me. <laughs> oh, this. Oh, just a little something oh, for you. Darling, I can't imagine what it is. I hope you can't. Frank, a necklace. <laughs> it must have cost you the earth. Very nearly. Mm. But I don't grudge a penny. You're a nice, kind man. Oh, and I want to see it on. Not over this dress. Wait till I've changed. Oh, come on, over to the mirror. Here, let me. Watch my hair. <laughs> Had it set specially for tonight. There. It's beautiful. Quite beautiful, Frank. So I've had something engraved on the clasp. Oh, what does it say? Just a happy tenth. Did you think I'd forgotten how many? No, <laughs> but after the fifth, one's inclined to lose count. <laughs> Fool. <laughs> now, wait. I've got something for you, too. Oh, oh, oh Ruth, you shouldn't. <laughs> Which means if I hadn't, you'd have been furious. <laughs> I, uh, I can't even begin to guess. <sighs> well? Uh, cufflinks. What's wrong? Don't you like them? Yes, 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 of course. Then what is it? Now, don't tell me you've a pair exactly like them. Well, as a matter of fact, I have. Ralph gave me a similar pair this morning. Ralph? Yes, you two should have consulted each other. But I told him I was thinking of buying you cufflinks. Oh, did you? Well, it was obviously a misunderstanding. Oh, not to worry. I'm sure they'll change them. That's not the point. Ah, oh, forget it, darling. I'll take them back first thing. Oh, uh, uh, by the way, do you know who I bumped into as I left the jewellers? Carol Sanford. Carol Sanford? Hmm. The girl Ralph was friendly with? Yes, yes, I offered her a lift. She was rather reluctant for some reason, but I turned on the old charm. I may be wrong, but I think the poor girl was quite embarrassed to see me. Why? I don't know. When I mentioned Ralph's name, she was, um, well, how shall we say, decidedly cool. She and Ralph must have had a tiff or something. That doesn't mm. surprise me. Mm, what does that mean? Well, let's face it, darling, that boy of yours isn't the easiest person to get along with. I know, I've tried. <laughs> You're always dropping hints about Ralph. What does he do? Is he rude to you? I wish he were. Then at least I'd feel some contact. He's just... Just what? Indifferent. Oh. Honestly, if I happen to find myself in the same room as he is, he has the happy knack of making me feel I'm not there. Oh, you're exaggerating. I'm not. Believe me, Frank. And lately it's got worse. In what way? I don't know. Well, look, I, I know he's not the easiest person to reach, but after all, the boy's been unwell. He's had a breakdown. But that was months ago. I'd have thought he'd have recovered by now. Well, I had another chat with Dr Medway. These things take time. But if only he'd make an effort. 
take a holiday, go abroad somewhere. All he does is lock himself into his room or wander off on his own. Oh, young people are like that at his age. He'll sort himself out in time. Now, how about a drink? What do you have? The usual. Oh, come on, snap out of it. I say, is Flora taken to the bottle? What? Well, this decanter was full at the weekend. Flora's teetotal. Oh. Ralph? Well, I hate to carry tales. But... Uh, where is he? Upstairs? No, he's not in. He went out soon after lunch. Uh, yes, I believe it was somewhere along here, Inspector. All right, driver. Pull up. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Ellinger, I want you to show me exactly where you picked this girl up. It was about here. I'm pretty sure of it. Uh, I remember I was 20 or 30 yards past the junction leading to Wroxham. She stood on this verge, you say, and waved you down? Yes. Well, was it dark at the time? Well, it was after ten, it must have been. Hmm. Well, I'm surprised you didn't miss her as you turned off toward Wintersley. Well, there aren't any cat's eyes on this road. I had my headlights full on. Which road did you take to Yarmouth? The A417. And this pub you stopped at? What was it called? Uh, the, um, Three Crowns. That's a couple of miles further on. Do you drop in there regularly? No, it was... It was the first and last time. All right. Back in the car. That pub's our next port of call. <coughs> Can you recall who served you, Mr. Ellinger? Uh, oh, yes. The man with the paunch behind the bar. All right. Let's go up to the counter. Yes, sir. What'll it be? I'm a police officer. Oh, yes? What can I do for you? This young gentleman with me. Have you ever seen him before? I can't say that I have. No, don't rush it. Take your time. This is very important. See here. Uh, what's this all about? That's not your worry. Now, do you recognize him? Let me see. <clears throat> no. No, I don't. I was with a young girl. Irish. She had red hair and wore a light coat. How long ago was this? About a year. <laughs> a year? Good grief. That's going back a bit. Do you know how many customers I get in here every day? Hundreds. Almost every other car stops here. I dare say. But do try and remember. What time did you come in? About 10.15. Oh, that's our busiest spell. At that time, I can't tell one face from t'other. If you'd have dropped in last night, I wouldn't remember you. Oh, come along, Mr. Ellinger. Really? Thank you, sir. I'm obliged to you for your help. That's all right. This is the place, Inspector. I parked the car at the top of the cliff road, and then I, I carried her body to, over to the edge. Here, you say? Yes. It was very windy that night. I had a job to keep my balance. Was the tide in or out? Oh, I, I can't be sure. It was pretty dark. It was, uh, it was in, I think. All right, Mr. Ellinger. Well, we'll try that hotel in Yarmouth. Uh, do come in, gentlemen. Oh, my credentials, Mr. Carstairs. <laughs> yes, of course, sir. This is Mr. Ellinger. How do you do? Uh, will you take a seat? Uh, no, no, thanks. We're in something of a hurry, Mr. Carstairs. We're trying to trace a girl. A girl? Yes, we've very little to go on, but we believe she was coming to work here. Uh, when exactly? Last June. Well, if she did sound come, we can soon trace her. I'll check my fires. Oh, what's the girl's name? Peggy. We've no surname. Oh, well, frankly, every other kitchen maid's called Peggy. No, she was Irish. Around, around 20, with, with red hair and green eyes. Uh, that sounds like one of a dozen who've worked here in recent years. Uh, I tell you the truth, most of our farm labour's Italian these days. They come over by the boatload. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry, I've no correspondence with an Irish girl at the time you mentioned. But she told me she was coming here. No, oh, probably on the off chance. We're always short of staff, and if she'd come, we'd certainly have taken her on. I'm afraid I've got no record of her. She was about 22, 23. You got that? Red hair, green eyes, wearing a light coat with large buttons down the front. No, there's no photograph. <laughs> 
You don't have to tell me that, look. I know it's not much to go on, but it's all we got. Well, she come by Liverpool, someone might have seen her. Lorry driver, maybe. Ah, well, get in touch, boy. Oh, hello, Inspector. I, uh, I just been out in Norwich, and I also checked with Liverpool. Well? You were right. She wouldn't need no passport to travel from Northern Ireland. Mm-hmm. And by boat, there'd be no record. It's just like buying a railway ticket. Mm. Well, what about missing persons? I checked while I was on the headquarters. Oh. No one of that description on the list. And the only bodies washed up during the past year were two elderly people, both identified. Yeah. How do you fare, sir? Oh, no luck at the pub or the hotel. Ah, well, I suppose it is a bit dicey after a year, but uh, it does seem odd that no one's reported her missing. Her family, I mean. Well, that depends. If she left home, they probably wouldn't give it a second thought. Yes. I, uh, I suppose there's no chance that our young friend in there is pulling our legs? I won't pretend, Sergeant. That thought had crossed my mind. <laughs> well, you know what some of those college chaps are like, sir. <laughs> Anything for a lock. <laughs> I know that only too well. No, don't get up, Mr. Ellinger. Oh, no. You care for a smoke? No, not just now, thanks. Well, maybe I won't either. Mr. Ellinger, I know Wintersley is just a small town, but believe me, we're pretty busy here. And although we seem like country yokels, we don't take kindly to tomfoolery or practical jokes. I don't quite no, see just it. let me finish, will you? I was young myself once, and I know the sort of pranks that students get up to. Pranks? <laughs> I remember painting a statue bright yellow, and for months I was the hero of the school. No, I assure you, Inspector, Well, I... whatever your reason, you've wasted my entire afternoon and put my staff to a great deal of trouble. Now, the truth is, we have no trace of this girl. In fact, no reason to believe that she ever existed. Now, but if you I... care to retract this statement... Apologize and give me your assurance that it won't happen again. You can leave here without further ado. But I tell you, I did kill this girl. Why? Why? Yes, why? Well, I'm... There's usually a motive. I, I told you, it, it, it was on a sudden impulse. There's nothing more than that. Oh, come now, Mr. Ellinger. You look an intelligent chap to me. I'm sure you know when a joke's gone far enough. I swear to you, I am... This is not a joke. Mr. Ellinger... You realise if you persist in this story, I shall have to notify your family. This could be serious for them, as well as for you. But of course I realise that. And you still insist that you kill this girl? Yes. Very well. Then you leave me no alternative. Frank! Mm. Would you Mm. sit me up? Uh, Just a minute. With a towel. Here you mm. are. Oh, thanks. Mmm, mm, you look stunning. <laughs> you look frightful. <laughs> Give me a chance. It's about a brilliant teen, a touch of aftershave, and I'll be a different man. No, a shot like that at all. <sighs> ah, there. Smell that. Irresistible. Uh, me or the aftershave? I'm still waiting to be zipped up. <laughs> Turn around. Z- zip. There you are. Thank you. Now, do hurry up or we should be late. Oh, no, there's no hurry. They serve till about 11. Well, I'm not waiting for my dinner till 11. In an hour, I shall be famished. Then ask for to fix you a sandwich. <laughs> really? Uh, where's my tie? Here. No, let me. I'm an expert. Is, uh, Ralph back yet? I haven't seen him. Oh, well, I thought we'd all have a drink together. There we are. Oh, thanks. He's probably gone to a cinema. I've arranged with Flora to leave him something cold. Your jacket? Ah, ta. Now, let's make sure I've got everything. Uh, Watch, handkerchief, wallet. Mm, Don't forget (laughs) that, whatever you do. Yes, come in. Sorry to bother you, sir. Yes, what is it, Flora? There's an inspector on the telephone. He asked to speak to you. Inspector? Oh, don't tell me there's a burglary at the office. Shall be a moment, Ruth. Hello? Yes, speaking. Yes. Yes, I I see. Well, what's the trouble exactly? Can't you be more specific? Look, I'm I'm just on my way out. Very well, I'll be down. Goodbye. What is it, darling? (sighs) 
Believe it or not, Ralph's down at the police station. What's happened? Oh, Lord only knows. Another car accident, I expect. Oh, no. He couldn't have chosen a better night, could he? Oh, Flora. Oh, yes, sir? Uh, ring the Star Hotel in Norwich, would you? I've booked a table. Tell them we may be a little late. This girl's coat, Mr. Ellinger. I'd like you to describe it again, if you would. But, Inspector, how many times do I have to... Please, tell... Mr. Ellinger. The coat. It was loose-fitting with large buttons down the front. What colour? Green. But you described it as a light coat in your first statement. I meant the buttons were green. The coat was, 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 was fawn or grey. I, I, I can't be sure. So I gather. Now, the pub you visited was the Three Crowns at Pooley? No, Roxham. And she was going to work at the Queen at Cromer? Yes. No, Yarmouth. Oh, look. I'm tired and you're confusing me. Yes, I'm becoming a little confused myself. Don't you believe anything I say? I'm trying, Mr. Ellinger. Believe me, I'm trying. Yes? He's arrived, sir. Well, oh, thank you, Sergeant. Your father's here. So? You still sticking to this statement? I am. Well, very well, sir. Just remain here for a moment. Frank Edlinger? Yes. Inspector Hadley, CID. Oh, how are you? This is my wife. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Edlinger? I'm oh, pleased to come through, won't you? Thank you. Hello, oh, uh, what's this boy of mine been up to? Well, sir, I think you'd better read this statement. Mm, thank you. It was entirely voluntary. I took down the details, but the boy signed it, as you can see. You say Ralph made the statement? Yes. In the presence of my sergeant and me. May I, please? <laughs> it's ludicrous. You're surely not taking it seriously. Well, sir, I can hardly dismiss it. In fact, I've already made some preliminary inquiries. And? Well, so far, I must admit, there is no evidence to support this. Well, I can promise you there won't be. Oh? Oh, we should have contacted me sooner, Inspector. It would probably have saved you a great deal of time and trouble. You see, about six months ago, my son had a serious nervous breakdown. Oh, is that a fact? Yes, I'm afraid he overdid things up at the university. Ah, uh -huh. now who's been treating him, sir? Uh, the Dr. Medway. I can let you have his address. Mm. Well, now, that does throw a different light on the matter. I thought it might. Not that I could have charged him, sir. There's not a prima facie case. On this evidence, I couldn't hold him even if I'd wanted to, providing, of course, he's not a danger to himself or others. Uh, this um, hasn't got to the press, has it? Oh, no, 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 sir. No, thank heaven for that. I have my business to think of. Where is the boy? Uh, next door. This way, sir. Uh, Frank, now, don't worry, you... Ruth, don't worry. Everything will be all right. Your father's here, Mr. Ellinger. Hello, Ralph. We've come to take you home. You what? We've come to take you home. Now, everything's arranged. You're not to worry. No, but I've made a statement. Yes, yes, we know all about that, but you're not to worry about a thing. No, but I killed this girl. Now, try and look at this intelligently, Ralph. You've been ill. The sooner we get you home, the sooner we can straighten things out. There's nothing to straighten out. Look, I, you, you've been wondering why I didn't go back to Cambridge. Well, this was the reason. The breakdown was an excuse. Yes, we'll talk about it later. No, but I You can't made... stay here. The police have no jurisdiction to hold you. Is that right, Inspector? Yes, it is. But I've confessed, haven't I? I mean, you, you've got it there in black and white. I've told you how I killed her, when and where. What more do you want? I'm afraid I can't argue with you, you sir. Think, you think I imagined it all, or, or, or that I'm off my head? No one's suggesting that, Ralph. But you need help. But Don't it, you see that? It's the truth. It may be unpalatable, but I can't help that. Now come along, Ralph. I should, if I were you, sir. My car's parked outside. Well, I can find my own way, thanks. Believe me, Ellinger, you've really nothing to worry about. All the same, Denton, I, I thought you ought to know about it. I'm glad you came. But remember, I'm a solicitor, not a criminal mm. lawyer. Though from what you've told me, I'm quite sure the police won't proceed further. I should just forget about it if I were you. But how can I? He still insists he killed this girl. Have you uh, consulted a doctor? Yes, I was on Medway's doorstep first thing. And what did he have to say? Well, he's one of these GPs of the old school. He seems confused as I am. Mumbled something about a sedative and finally suggested I call in someone else. A psychiatrist? Yes. Well, that's exactly what you ought to do. Look, there's a chap who's given evidence for us on several occasions. Uh, Rooney's his name. Mm. Very reliable. I'll get you his address, but uh, in the first instance, I should get Medway to write him. Yes, Flora? 
The gentleman's arrived, sir. I'll show him in, Flora. All this way, sir. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Rooney, how do you do? How are you? Oh, Frank Ellinger. <clears throat> Sorry I couldn't get here before today. It's not my usual practice. No, it was good of you to come. It's a very attractive house you have here. You like it? Yes, I bought it when I remarried. We've been here ten years. My business is in knowledge, but I prefer to live a little way out. Mm, I envy you. I'm surrounded by industry. Oh. But as most of my patients are executives, I mustn't complain. No, no, no. You'd like to get rid of your coat? Oh, thanks. I should drop it over the back of the chair. Uh, here? Yes. Uh, can I offer you a drink? Uh, not for me, thank you. But you go ahead. I gather you, from Dr. Medway's letter, you've uh, had a spot of trouble. That's putting it mildly. It's been like living on the edge of a volcano. I've tried talking some sense into the boy, but he won't budge. And Dr. Medway thought it would be a good idea to call someone in. And do you? Hmm? Uh, think it's a good idea? Well, since you ask, frankly, no. After all, it's... I know. <sighs> Better a fracture or an ulcer in the family yeah. than mental illness, eh? Well, since you put it like that... What exactly is it you want me to do? Well, I'm not sure. See the boy, I suppose. Talk to him. Find some reason for his fantastic behaviour. And treat him? Naturally. So there's little doubt in your mind that he is mentally ill. I wouldn't put it quite so strongly as that. He's got some bee in his bonnet, that's all. <clears throat> but bees come in many varieties. <laughs> well, what I mean is he doesn't seem off his head to me. He's under some strain or another, but let's face it, who isn't today? True. He's probably got what you chaps call neurosis, don't you think? I uh, rarely diagnose at second hand. <laughs> well, I don't think he's insane. But that would be more acceptable than having a murderer in the family. Acceptable is hardly the word. Preferable, perhaps. But then his whole story is a complete fabrication, so I discuss it. It's caused me a great deal of embarrassment, I can tell you that. And I'm anxious to get to the bottom of it. Psychiatry mm. to the rescue, eh? You know, Mr. Ellinger, daily I'm consulted by counsel, sometimes by the defence, sometimes by the prosecution, often about the same case. Both want solutions, but always the one that suits them. There's a check, if you can oblige. The way out, if you can't. A great many doors have closed behind me... I'm afraid I can't tailor my diagnosis to save you embarrassment. But if you want the truth, then perhaps I can help. That is all I want. Then I'll see your boy. Does he know you've consulted me? I did mention it, casually. What did he say? Nothing. He just smiled. Won't be plain sailing. Never is. Now, I'd, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to make a few notes on his background, if you'll bear with me. Yes, no, of course. Right. Now, uh, Ralph's age is... Uh, 22. And his general health? Until his breakdown, excellent. Any complaints of headaches, throat trouble, any other aches and pains? No, not as far as I know. Any history of insanity in the family? Certainly not. Good. Now, if I remember rightly, Dr. Medway mentioned he'd been up at Cambridge. Yes, studying law. Uh, how did he get on? Very well, above average, I believe. Mm -hmm. As a child, was he very imaginative? Not unduly so, no. This is your second marriage? Yes, his mother died when he was 11. How did he take his mother's death? He was away at school at the time. I didn't see him till after the funeral. He seemed to take it very well. How soon after did you remarry? Is that relevant? If it wasn't, I shouldn't have asked. Oh, um, six months. Did you talk to him about it? We had a chat. He seemed unconcerned. He was more interested in a new fishing rod. Uh -huh. How does he get on with his stepmother? Well enough. Ralph's never been what I'd call demonstrative. And with you? Not too badly. To tell you the truth, he's a bit on the arty side, if you know what I mean. He wanders around with his head in the clouds. Half the time, I don't know what he's talking about. Has he any girlfriends? Yes, he had one. What sort of a girl? Nice sort of girl. Works in the local library. Her name's Carol Sanford. Mm -hmm. Sanford. Yes, that fizzled out some time ago. Don't ask me why. When did you first notice any change in his behaviour? Well, now I come to think of it. About a year ago, and just after my wife and I got back from abroad... He'd shut himself away in his room, wouldn't talk to anyone, and uh, started helping himself to my drink. I take it he's never been in trouble with the police before? No. Oh, I'm sorry, Frank. Oh. I've just got back. I didn't know you had anyone with you. Oh, this is Dr. Rooney, my wife. How do you do? Uh, hello, Mrs. Ellinger. I only came in to remind you that we're dining with the Frosts. Oh, yes. Also, I've managed to get two seats for the concert. Ah, splendid. Well, Dr. Rooney, you'll want to see Ralph, I expect. Uh, if I may. He's in his room. I'll take you up. Oh, 
forgive me, I did not. Please, one moment. I see we have the same taste, Mr. Ellinger. Bartok, I have the Philharmonic recording. Really, I don't care for it myself. Hmm. Well, that divan looks very comfortable. I'm Dr. Rooney, by the way. Yes, the trick cyclist. Interpreter of dreams, repressions, obsessions and phallic symbols. I'm flattered. I've never looked on myself as anything more than a good listener. <laughs> then if I know my father, you've already earned your fee. I'm sure he's given you the complete picture. If he had, I shouldn't be here. Oh, then you'll find me a fascinating case. An unstable personality abounding in complexes and delusions. You look pretty stable to me. Ah, oh, naughty. You should know better, Doctor. Never judge a book by its cover. I mean, to look at me, you'd never believe I killed a charming, helpless girl, would you? That these hands had squeezed the life out of her without rhyme or reason. <laughs> no, of course not. Well, don't worry, Doctor, you're in good company. It is odd, though, isn't it? We spend millions on the detection of crime, but confess. Offer yourself on a plate. And the truth isn't enough. They want evidence, witnesses. And if you can't produce them, they sentence you to live with it. You'll be surprised at the number of people who daily confess to crimes they've never committed. Two or three of them arrive in my consulting room every week. If the laws of evidence weren't there to protect them, they'd spend half their lives in jail. Suppose one of your patients were guilty. I've yet to meet one. They're usually people who are frustrated, rejected. Some need the limelight and publicity. Others seek punishment to allay certain guilt feelings. Thanks for the lecture, Sally. I can't fit into one of your pigeonholes. Do you smoke? On occasions, like a chimney. Do help yourself. Yes, thanks. This is one of them. Now, Mr. Ellinger. Ralph, please. Informality will help establish transference, don't you think? <laughs> Well, Ralph, I'd uh, like to ask you a question, if I may. Whether I object or not, you'll ask it, so go ahead. Now, supposing I was to tell you that uh, two or three years ago I'd killed someone, and now I'd come along to confess, what would you say? I'd wonder how you managed to hold out that long. I only lasted a year. Why didn't you confess right away? <laughs> what a question. Because I was afraid. Afraid of being found out, caught, punished. That's only natural, isn't it? Yes. I wasn't insane. I knew I'd killed the girl. I knew I'd done wrong. I didn't relish the thought of ending up with a rope round my neck. Then why this sudden change of heart? Oh, bec because there are things that go on inside of one that I never knew about. Call it conscience, call it what you like. You know, it's ironic. I was a law student of all things. Well, I found I, I couldn't attend a lecture without being reminded of what I'd done. Couldn't see a girl in the street without thinking of her... the feeling of her body suddenly going limp. Her eyes... the wind against my face as I dropped her body over the cliff. And then the sudden fear when I found... Yes, go on. When I found... What is it, Ralph? Oh, good God! How could I have forgotten that? Forgotten what, Ralph? Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. What is, what's the trouble? It's my jacket. You're sitting on it. Do you mind? But, but where are you off to? <laughs> so, I imagined it all, did I? We'll see. Where are you going? Wouldn't you like to know? Ralph, what are you doing down here? I'm going out. Where to? That's my business. Ralph, I'm talking to you. You let go of my arm. Have you seen Dr. Rooney? Yes, I've seen him. What is it, Frank? What's happened? God knows. Rooney, what's going on? I don't know. Ralph, would you mind telling me where you're going? If you must know, to the police. For God's sake, haven't you caused enough trouble? What are you going to do now? Tell them about the handbag. Handbag? What handbag? The girls. The one I killed. I found it in the car the following day. Where is it? I threw it in the marsh. Along the Norwich Road. Sergeant, I'd like a word with you. Come in, sir. I hope you don't object to my presence, Inspector. Why should I, Mr. Ellinger? 
Oh, blast. My right foot's a soldier. There must be a leak in my boot. Excuse me a moment, Mr. Ellinger. Yes, yes, of course. How's it going, Lamerson? No luck so far. We've covered the North Marsh for about half a mile, not a sausage. What's the bottom like? Pretty muddy. Hmm. How far out have you been? About 50 yards, and that's a great deal further than any one could throw a handbag. Mm. Have you found anything? <laughs> yep, the usual. Bicycle frames, a <laughs> few wheels, and an old brass bedstick. <laughs> I'm thinking of going into the old iron business. Not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Here I say. Huh? Whose kids are those? Oh, I don't know. Probably from that cottage across the marsh, I well, should think. Better give them a shout. Didn't safe for them to be playing around here. Right, sir. And you and the lads had better work down the south side. Oh, bless the boys love that. <laughs> hey, you kids, everything. Go on. That's dangerous to play here, look. Inspector, you don't really expect to find anything, do you? I'm sorry, sir, but having received this information, it's my duty to act on it. Yes, I appreciate that, but the boy's obviously unwell. Today it's a handbag in the marsh. Tomorrow he'll come up with some other cotton bull story. Right, go! Oh, come on! No, no, not a bigger yeah. stone as that! This one, yes! Go once. You get stuck in that barge and you'll find yourselves in real trouble! Well, what are all those men doing out there, mister? Are you coppers? Never you mind! Now go on! Back home! Laura, has Ralph gone out? No, ma'am. He's in the study. Thank you. Hmm? It's all right, Ralph. You don't have to hide that bottle behind your back. If you want a drink, you're welcome to it. I don't know why I bother. It doesn't help. Then why do you? It's thirst quenching. I wish I could understand you. You've everything a boy could want. Is that so? Yet you carry a chip on your shoulder the size of a house. God, you talk in cliches, don't you? What is it you want, Ralph? From you, nothing. From anybody. You walk around with a face as long as a week. Here we go again. You imagine I'm something of a fool, don't you? Well, I'm not. I love people who ask you a question and then answer it themselves. Oh, I know you've never liked me. There's no need to pretend. You look on me as something of an intruder, don't you? I've never really thought about it. Then it's about time you started thinking. What can you hope to achieve by this story? I'm not with you. What do you hope to gain by? Can't you see what it's doing to your father? Is it some way of hitting back at him? Oh, for God's sake! Don't turn your back on me. You know what I'm talking about. Do I? The truth is, you resent the attention he pays to me. You always have, ever since I came into the house. <sighs> don't deny it. I've noticed the way you look at me. You're way off the beam. I couldn't care less about you. I don't believe a word. You're jealous. <laughs> I don't have to be a psychiatrist to see that. <laughs> you and Rooney would make a fine pair. Well, won't you join me, Mother? Ralph, please listen to me. You know very well you never killed that girl. Your statements are lie from beginning to end. There's no bag. There never was a bag. Now, why don't you admit it? Admit it. They're back. What? I heard a car door. Oh. It's your father's. I knew it. They found the bag. Frank, what's happened? Well, I've come here. Put down that glass and come here. Don't let me have to ask you again. Well, well, let's hear the glad tidings. They didn't find anything. What? The police didn't find any bag. Oh, but I, I took them down there. I showed them where I threw it. They've had a dozen men there the entire day. They've searched for half a mile either side of the road. They didn't find anything. Oh, well, perhaps I, I made a mistake. It, it was dark when I threw it out and the car was moving. You're ill. You realise that, don't you? What you believe is the truth is just a figment of your imagination. Try and understand. No, I tell you, I threw her bag into the marsh. Ralph, if this goes on, sooner or later, it'll get into the press. You want that to happen? All you can think about is the press and your business. It's never occurred to you that I might be telling the truth. No. Well, let me repeat it once again. I killed that girl. Is that clear? I killed her, not from spite or malice or any reason that I know, but I killed her and I'll prove it to you. Somehow I'll prove it to you. Oh. Mr. Gray? Oh, that's me. I'm Inspector Hadley. I've driven over from Wintersley. I won't keep you a moment. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you're the chap who called by yesterday when I was out. That's right, yes. Uh, my wife did mention something. 
It was my market day. Oh, I'm sorry I've given you an extra journey. Oh, that's all right. Oh, these dirty no, kids. Mine. Here, stop that noise, will you? If you want to play, go into the yard. He's got my ball. Well, there's half a dozen others in the shed. Now go on, round the back, both on you. Ah, oh, oh, little devils. Your kids? Mm hmm. I saw them playing in the marsh yesterday. <laughs> it's pretty treacherous out there, though. Oh, I shouldn't worry about them. It's been their playground since they were so high. Now, what's it you want to see me about? Oh, just a routine call. We were led to understand that a woman's bag was thrown into the marsh a short distance from here. Handbag? Yes. A light plastic affair with broad stitching and a shoulder strap. I wondered if either you or your wife had seen anything like it floating around. When was it thrown there, do you know? Well, some time back. Last year, in fact. No, no, I haven't come across it. I'm sure my wife had mentioned it if she had. Well, I'm sorry to have troubled you. Thank you for your help again, Mr. Gray. Ah, I've been looking all over for you, sir. I'd almost given up. Uh, well, I called back to see Mr. Gray without much success. I'm not surprised. Oh, well, now, what's your problem, Lumsden? Well, sir, I, uh, I got a friend of yours outside. Oh? Who? Young Alan, Jip. Oh, no. Not again. Yep. Should I send him packing or get on the blower to his father? No. Let's have him in. Sir. In fact, I'll see you, Mr. Allinger. Go on in. All right, Sergeant. Sir. It was good of you to see me, Inspector. Oh, what is it this time, Mr. Ellinger? Look, I'm sorry about the bag. I know you've been put to a great deal of trouble. Mm, that's the understatement of the year. But it is somewhere in the marsh, believe me. I, I might have thrown it further on. You see, I was travelling at about 30 miles an hour. Mr. Ellinger, just take a look at this map, will you? There are thousands of acres of marshland between here and Norwich. And it'd take my men a month of Sundays to cover that area. Yes. Now, look now, here, I... son. Why don't you go home like a good boy? You know, I'm getting just a little tired of you, Mr. Ellinger. Do you know where I've been for the last couple of hours? No, do tell me. Down to the seafront. Oh, I wish I could have joined you. Instead, I've been gallivanting around the countryside and to no avail. Look, I'm sorry you couldn't find the bag. Not half as sorry as I am. But maybe this will convince you. What is it? It's one of her buttons off her coat. Where'd you get this? I found it on the beach, among the rocks below the cliff. Oh? How do I know that? What? How do I know you found this button on the beach? Because I'm telling you. But you've told me so many things, haven't you? But it's off her coat, I'm sure of it. And, and, and I swear to you, I found it at the foot of the cliff. Well, even if you had, what would it prove? I don't understand. Did anyone else see the girl in the coat? Well, uh, in the pub. They don't remember you. Besides, these buttons are manufactured in their hundred thousand. Oh, for goodness sake, man, use your head. But you think I'm being unreasonable, don't you? But my job isn't to prove a man guilty or innocent. As a law student, you should know that in a capital charge, I merely submit a report to the Director of Public Prosecutions. Yes, I do know that. And only then can I make an arrest. Now, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? I ask you. You see... I suppose you think that I've been neglectful, don't you? Well, believe me, I haven't. I've been in touch with Liverpool, circulated your description of the girl, checked with missing persons both here and in Ireland. I've even spoken to the hydrographic section of the Admiralty to check the tides last year. They said it was possible that a body might have been carried toward the coast of Germany. So, the Yard have even spoken to Interpol, without any success, I might add. I've checked with everyone who could have been of the slightest help. Well, you'll agree that we've been pretty thorough, eh? Yes, sir. But you, you haven't produced a single witness or an item of evidence to substantiate any part of your story. Well, can you blame me for being sceptical? No, I haven't come across many murderers in my time, but the few I have met have been very anxious not to be caught. Well, doesn't your behaviour strike you as rather odd? You don't realise what's going on inside me. Well, that's hardly my province. But if you want my candid opinion, son, you need a rest. Now, you go away for a spell. 
But whatever you do, I don't want to see you here again. And for your father's sake, stay out of trouble. Oh, Miss Haynes, I told you I didn't want to be disturbed. I'm working on the Mansfield estimate. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ellinger, but it's Mr. Ryder mm. from the Gazette. He said what? it was very urgent. Frank, forgive oh. me for barging in like oh, this. Oh, Bill, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was you. All right, Miss Haynes. Yes, sir. I was going to telephone, but on second thoughts, I decided to make it a personal uh, call. Pull up a chair. Uh, no, I haven't time for a cosy chat. <laughs> we go to press today. Um, now, let me come straight to the point and then get the hell away out of here. What's up with you? I, um... Found your boy waiting in my office when I got back from lunch. Oh, yes? He spilled me a fantastic story. Well, frankly, it made my hair stand on end. How about a girl, an Irish girl? Oh, yes, you know about it? Yes, I certainly do. It's been going on for some time now. I've had to call in a psychiatrist. Oh, I thought as much. <coughs> yeah, I remember you telling me he hadn't been well. Well, uh, nothing's leaked out. No, no, of course not. There's no question of publication. Well, I'm very grateful to you, Bill. Oh, don't thank me, please. Look, if there's anything I can oh, do... Oh, not just now. No. Well, I'd better get back to the office. Uh, give my love to Ruth. Yes, I will. Oh, Miss Haynes. Yes, Mr. Ellinger. Uh, call this number, will you, and get Dr. Rooney on the line. I'm sorry I couldn't get here sooner, but I was delayed at the hospital. <sighs> well, Dr. Rooney, I had a call from the inspector. Ralph's been down to the police station again. When was this? Before lunch. This time about a button he said he'd found on the beach. I'm surprised Hadley didn't put him under lock and key. The boy is not certifiable, at least not in my opinion. You might change your mind when you hear the rest. He then called in at the offices of the Gazette. It's a good job the editor's a friend of mine, I can tell you, or his confession might have been splashed across the front page. You'd hardly describe that as normal behaviour, would you? I know it's distressing for you. <laughs> distressing, good God. Look, I'd like Ralph to be at my consulting room tomorrow morning. Why? I think it might be an idea to exclude the possibility of any physical abnormality. Say, 11.30. I'll do what I can. But I'll probably need a team of wild horses. I'll relieve you of that jacket, uh, Ralph, and uh, onto the couch. Leave my shoes on? Yes, that's all right. When I've done this encephalogram, my nurse will take a blood sample, and then I want you to go across to the hospital for an X-ray. <sighs> It must be costing my father a packet. You talk as though he keeps you short. Oh, heaven forbid, you know, he's generous. More than generous. Then why don't you like him? Did I say that? Just raise your head a little. Now, I don't worry about these wires. They what? won't give you a shock or anything. It's an odd gadget. I feel as though I'm about to be launched into space. <laughs> yeah, I'm almost through. There. Now... I shall uh, ask you to do one or two things. Just do them, but don't talk. You're asking a lot. Ready? <laughs> yes. Breathe in. Hold it. Breathe out. Now, close your eyes. Open them. Now, close them again. Fine, that's all. Can I open them? <laughs> yes, but uh, no, no, stay where you are. <laughs> Just let me get rid of this paraphernalia. <sighs> Tell me, what do, you, uh, what do you do in your spare time? Oh, books, music. No friends? I find it difficult enough to contend with myself. Your father mentioned a girl you were friendly with, a Miss uh, Sanford. Oh, did he? How was she like? Oh, upper crust intellectual. Pretty. Sounds promising. Yes. Well, if you're through, uh, <coughs> where do I go for this blood test? Uh, yes, sir. Could I help you? Yes, I wonder if you could tell me where I can find Miss Sanford. Well, she's about somewhere. Oh, she's with the trolley. Over there by the fine arts section. Oh, thank you. Miss Sanford? Yes? Oh, forgive me, my name is Dr. Rooney. Oh, if it's the medical section you want, it's just on the other side of the gangway. Uh, no, this is a personal matter. Oh? I really shouldn't be bothering you. Please carry on. What is it you want to see me about? I believe you know a young man called Ralph Allinger. I did? Uh, he happens to be a patient of mine. Oh, is he ill? Well, he's not exactly ill. Uh, I think I understand. 
You're a psychiatrist, aren't you? You don't seem very surprised. I'm not. May I ask why? Must I talk about it? I'd rather not. Might help. All right. What is it you want to know? When did you stop seeing Ralph? Six or seven months ago. You know I expect that he had a breakdown. Yes, I did hear something about it. Oh, but it wasn't on my account, I promise you. As a matter of fact, I, I wrote to him when I heard, but he never replied. You knew him well, though. Very. At one time, we were... Oh, that was all over a long time ago. What went wrong, exactly? I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. For some unaccountable reason, he became remote, detached. He began to drink. He'd let me down, and when we did meet, we did nothing but quarrel. About what? Oh, anything, everything. Mm -hmm. Did he ever mention a girl called Peggy to you? Peggy? Peggy who? An Irish girl. That's, uh, that's all I know about her. No, he never mentioned her to me. Who is she? I'm not sure myself at the moment. Now, what I'm going to ask you may seem a little odd. Was he ever violent towards you in any way? Who, Ralph? Now, this is very important, Miss Sanford. Was he ever aggressive towards you? Good heavens, no. Why'd you ask? Well, what's happened? Oh, nothing for you to worry about. Now, about his behaviour. To your knowledge, did he ever... Did he ever avoid certain places? It's odd you should ask me that. Um, we used to go for walks along the cliffs. And then suddenly he refused to go up there. And did he say why? No, he wouldn't give any reason... I can't tell you why, but at times he... he frightened me. I... Shh! This treasure's most disturbing. Oh, I'm sorry, madam. I'm afraid I haven't been much help, Dr. Rooney. On the contrary, I'm very Shh. grateful. <laughs> Goodbye, Miss Sanford. Goodbye. Oh, Frank, I'm glad you're back early. Why, has the Rooney arrived? No, but there is someone waiting to see you. Mm -hmm. A Mr. Preedy. Preedy? I don't know any Preedy. Well, if you'd rather not see him, oh, no, I'll... all right, all right. Uh, ask Flora to whip up some tea, will you? Yes, of course. Ah, Mr. Ellinger? Mr. Frank Ellinger? Yes? I am Joseph Preedy. Of the Preedy Investigation Bureau, Charlie Street, Norwich. My card. Yes, Mr. Preedy? You will understand, sir, that it is not usual for a member of my profession to betray a client's confidence. But, on the other hand, there are occasions when one has to draw the line. If you know what I mean, sir. I don't at the moment, but do go on. Well, let me put it like this, sir. There are times when I am asked to do something which may appear a trifle odd. Oh, you would be amazed at the number of crackpots who wind up in front of my desk, watch my neighbour's wife, or trace my ginger tongue. Yes, I'd be or... grateful if you'd be a little more precise, Mr. Preedy. <clears throat> of course. A young man by the name of Ralph Ellinger arrived in my office this afternoon. My son, you say? So I have since ascertained. He asked me to assist him in an investigation, the investigation of a murder. Oh, God. Now, sir, it is not the first time I have been approached on such matters. The Preedy Investigation Bureau has a reputation... Yes, quite, quite, quite. But do please keep to the point. Well, sir, you can imagine my surprise when your son stated he had committed the murder. Mm. I was a trifle shaken, to say the least... And you do see the quandary I was in, don't you, sir? Yes, 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 yes I do. <clears throat> Without offence, it was obviously a case of <clears throat> non compass metis, so I felt it my duty to follow him, sir, and this I did. Yes, I'm more than grateful to you, Mr. Preedy. You're quite right, my son is unwell. It was good of you to let me know of this incident. Uh, please do send me a bill to cover any out-of-pocket expenses. Oh, that is most kind of you, sir. Oh, most kind of you indeed, Well, from the x-rays, Mr. Ellinger, there's certainly no disease of the central nervous system. Oh, somehow it would have been a relief if there was. At least we'd have put our finger on it. Are you sure you won't have any tea, Doctor? No, thank you, Mrs. Ellinger. The encephalogram was normal and so were the blood tests. I've no doubt the boy's physically sound. What about his mental condition? Well, he's intelligent, well-orientated. His memory's a little hazy, but then there are no symptoms of mental disease. Look, Doctor, do you know what that boy did this afternoon? He visited a private detective in Norwich... To help him investigate. He's obviously unbalanced. I wouldn't have described him in that way. Well, how would you describe him? He's not specifically sick, but greatly disturbed. From the few talks I've had with him and the tests I've carried out, I'd say he was 
emotionally immature. That's a little vague, isn't it? To put it bluntly, he hasn't grown up. He's grown up enough to go and lie to the police. I'd call that childish. On occasions, he has a slight withdrawal from reality, but then so do we all. When we daydream for Oh, this is all so much mumbo-jumbo. Can you clear this condition up? That's what I want to know. In time, yes. How long? I'm not a contractor. I can't give you a delivery date. Psychoanalysis is a lengthy process. Weeks, months, years in some cases. I thought there were drugs you could use. There are. Pentothal, methadrine. But it's a drastic, painful way. Surely this calls for drastic action. My position's intolerable, don't you see that? If it'll help to get at the truth. But even if I use a drug, there's no guarantee. But surely it's worth a try. Very well, providing the boy agrees. Where shall I go, Doctor, on the divan? Yes, I think you'll be comfortable there. <laughs> but uh, jack it off, sleeve up. Right. Sure. Ah. You know, the last time I had an injection was at school. There were about 50 of us. By the time they got to me, the needle was blunt. I hope that one's nice and sharp. As a needle. I can't bear syringes. I'll turn your head the other way, if you prefer. Mm. What are you giving me? A little pentothal. To eliminate deception and reveal the truth, eh? <laughs> Now, that's somewhat exaggerated. Let's say it, it lowers the barriers and helps one relive certain experiences. So you still think I'm lying? Have I ever said you were? Now, just hold your arm still. This won't hurt. Now, just put on this lamp, draw the curtains. <coughs> now, now, don't you fidget, you nice still. <coughs> Did I tell you I'd thought of suicide? No. Oh, well, I had. Often. But I hadn't the guts. I don't know how I walked into that police station. You know, Doctor, this may interest you. Before I left the university, I was writing a thesis on crime and society. Do you know what I think? People want their pound of flesh providing it's not from the family circle. Hmm. Morality's so convenient, isn't it? How long does this stuff take to work? Oh, not long. A minute or so. Now, if you like to move your feet over, uh, just caught on the edge of the divan. Oh, do, do. Make yourself at home. How are you feeling? Oh, pleasant. <laughs> Very pleasant indeed. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. I feel as though I've had half a dozen gins. The <laughs> room's beginning to spin a oh, bit. No, no, no. Lie back. Lie back and relax. Beautiful. Beautiful. Wicked. Wicked. What is it, Ralph? What are you thinking about? That girl. Peggy. The one I killed. Did you kill her, Ralph? Oh, God, why doesn't anyone believe that? Of course. I killed her. We were sitting there. In the car. The windows were all misted up. I had my arm around her. And suddenly she looked older. I felt a kind of resentment stirring in me. And I couldn't remember what I was doing there, but it was as though I'd arranged it all. My head was aching. I felt I couldn't go on the way things were, and I had to be rid of her. Who? Oh. The girl, the girl! Then I got my hands around her throat and held them there, tight. I'd show her. Yes, I'd show her. Go on. Struggle, you bitch. Struggle. Hey, for all the good it'll do you. Oh, the pleasure of it. If only you knew. And then her face began to turn blue. And her eyes went all bloodshot, and as she stopped struggling, and there was some blood trickling down her lip onto my hand, I wiped it on her coat. Now, this simply didn't happen, did it, Ralph? It did, it did. Which is a thing I imagined, that drive to the cliff. I was so afraid, I could hardly grip the wheel. But she was lighter than I thought. 
and she seemed to float through the air as I dropped her over the edge. Then I drove back here. My father was abroad, having a grand time with his beloved Ruth. And I found some whiskey and drank the lot and fell asleep. Right here. Next day, I had a terrible shock. Found the bag. Whose bag? The girls. In the car. I had a broad stitching round the edge and a long shoulder strap. And I knew it was hers when I saw the initial. It was a large gilt M. M? Mm-hmm. I hid it in the cubby hole and then later I threw it in the marsh. <laughs> no. All this time, and I st- still, I can still hear her voice and smell her perfume. And w- w- won't I ever, ever be rid of her, Doctor? You, you must help me. Now, please help me. I can't no, suffer it anymore. No, 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 no. All right, old chap. No, <laughs> just, just take it easy. I'll give you some tablets. Just hang on. I'll get you a little water. <sighs> Now, take these. They'll make you feel a lot better. Thanks. That's the way. Now, I'll leave you a couple more. I shall take them about uh, 9.30. Now, just lie back and try and sleep. Well, has he had the injection, Doctor? Yes. How is he? Fair. Uh, could we go into your study? Yes, yes, of course, sir. Come along this way. Well, what happened? The same story, only this time more detailed. You know, it's odd. Most people with delusions are inclined to deviate, embellish, distort. Yet, well, Ralph, you surely can't believe there's any truth in his story. Sometimes it's difficult to separate what's true from fantasy. But either way, I think I understand his motive. You do? Yes. This murder, he describes, indicates hatred against someone or some situation. In this case, I believe that someone is your wife. Ruth. Well, there's nothing novel in that. The substitution of one person for another often happens in a criminal act. But Ruth, what has she ever done to him? Nothing deliberately. But in his mind, she may have deprived him of your love and companionship. Can't be serious. Ralph doesn't care a damn about me. A child hasn't been born who doesn't care about his mother or father. At the time of your marriage, the boy felt rejected. Oh, this is just psychiatric jargon. You think so, do you? Tell me, how much time have you given the boy in the past ten years? Well, I'm not exactly idle. My business doesn't run itself, you know. Yes, but you've time for parties, theatres, holidays. Yes, and so do thousands of other couples. They don't all drag their kids around with them. Why should he suddenly go off the rails? Why are some people accident-prone and others not? You can't generalise. The boy needed you. Emotionally, you gave him nothing. His hostility had to have an outlet... If you saw Ralph's statement, you'll notice the similarity between the girl he described and your wife. But murder! For heaven's sake! It may sound absurd, but the seeds of violence can't grow in a vacuum. They need a nourishing soil. It's usually found in the family. The boy craved for emotional security. You didn't give him that. Well, I'm sorry, I don't understand a word you're talking about. I've given the boy a good home, and Ruth's done everything to fill his mother's place. But he hasn't made the slightest effort. You ask me, he started this cock and bull story to cause trouble. To create a rift. Why else should he go to the police? The pressure of guilt, perhaps? The pressure of guilt, my foot. I don't believe a word of it. Under Penthesol, he described the girl's bag in detail. But there is no bag. The police couldn't find it. Ralph mentioned the initial M. M. He said it was in guilt lettering. So? Well, doesn't that strike you as odd? Yes, it does, considering he told us the girl's name was Peggy. Exactly. Peggy is a diminutive of Margaret. Margaret? Yeah. Now, if he was lying, why embroider it in such detail? In fact... Why mention the initial at all? He has a more colourful imagination than you give him credit for. Perhaps. Look, Doctor, the boy has his failings, but to my knowledge he's never lifted a finger to harm anyone. Can you honestly believe he'd kill a helpless young girl in cold blood? I don't know, Mr. Ellinger. I wasn't there. But we all have primitive impulses that constantly seek relief. And no one is incapable of murder, believe me. But there's no evidence, nothing. What he said under Pentathol would hardly be admissible. There's no case to answer. I agree, but whatever you or I believe, try and understand that he's burdened with an insufferable guilt. And this can be more painful than an open wound and far worse than anything the law can inflict. (sighs) 
If only you'd go away for a while, take a rest abroad. Wouldn't that help? Travel alone? Well, he's not a child, is he? <sighs> no, of course not. Well, perhaps it might be an idea for him to get away from here for a while. From me, you mean, don't you? It's his source of conflict. There's little point in aggravating it. Going abroad might be one solution, I suppose. Well, will you talk to him? He might listen to you. I'll try. I'll call by again in the morning. Thank you. Goodbye, Doctor. Ellinger. Hello? Dr. Rooney? Yes? I'm sorry to bother you so late, Doctor. It's Ralph Ellinger here. Oh, yes, Ralph. What's the trouble? Yes, I've just woken up. Now, I don't know whether it was the drug, the tablets, or what, but I've just remembered something else, something important. Yes, what is it? Well, the morning after it happened, I gave a friend of mine a lift. You remember the girl my father spoke about, Carol Sanford. Yes, go on. Well, I didn't find the bag in the car till the afternoon. It dropped between the seat and the door. So, she must have seen it as she climbed into the car, I'm sure of it. <laughs> now, I think you'll agree it's a little late to start another investigation. Let's talk well, about it in the morning. No, but, Doctor, this is important. It'll keep. Now, have you taken the other tablets I gave you? No, no, not yet. Well, take them right away, and I'll see you <laughs> first thing in the morning. Good night. But, but Doc... One, seven, four. One, seven, four. Winter's late, one, seven, four. Carol. Who is that? It's Ralph, Ralph Ellinger. Yes, fine. Look, I want to talk to you. It's very important. Well, what is it? No, not over the phone. Could you possibly meet me somewhere? What, tonight? But I'm in bed. But I must see you right away. I'm sorry, Ralph. It's terribly late and I have a busy day ahead of me. Carol, I must speak to then you. sometime tomorrow, perhaps. Good night. No. Oh. Carol. Who's that? Ralph. Shh, shh. Keep your voice down. Ralph. What are, you, what are you doing I'm here? I'm sorry, but I had to see you. Are you out of your mind? My father's room's across the hall. Please, Carol, this won't take long, but I must talk to you. Pass me my house coat, quickly. Listen, I only want to... It's quiet a minute. What's wrong? I thought I heard someone in the hallway. It's all right. Now, what do you want? Well, it's difficult to... Look... Carol, I need your help. C couldn't it wait till tomorrow? No, please. You probably won't believe what I'm going to tell you, but last year when I came down for the summer vac, I killed a girl. You killed a girl? Strangled, murdered, call it what you like. Then I threw her body into the sea, and there's no trace of her, nothing. Oh, Ralph, you are ill, aren't you? No, no, I'm not. Look, why don't you sit down and rest for a moment? I'll telephone your father. No. Well, can I get you anything? A, a drink, perhaps? Will you stop treating me like a sick creature or something? What I told you is the truth. Oh, what well, can't I make anyone understand? My father calls in a psychiatrist. Questions, questions, but no one listens. Even the police. Police? Yes, I made a full confession. But what I need is evidence. A single witness might make all the difference. But I can't help you, Ralph. You can. You can, if only you'll think back. I know you'll remember. Remember? Remember what? I gave you a lift the morning after it happened. Now, the girl's bag was in the car, lodged between the seat and the door. You must have seen it as you climbed in. I don't remember. Now, now, now it was a light plastic bag with heavy stitching and a strap. No, I, I don't remember any bag. Carol, think carefully, please. No, if I'd seen a bag, I'm sure I'd have remembered there it. There was an initial on the bag, too, the letter M. I'm sorry, Ralph. But you're not trying, you're not trying. Please, Ralph, you're hurting my arm. Think, for God's sake, think. Please leave go of me. <sighs> Thank you. Carol, don't you understand? 
You're my last chance if you don't help me. There's nothing I can do. But I didn't see the bag. Now, Ralph, please go. No. You're ill, Ralph. You need help, don't you see that? You didn't kill that girl. I know you. You couldn't hurt anyone. Couldn't I? No, I don't believe you could. So I imagined it all. It's all in my mind, eh? You're not a murderer, Ralph. You couldn't be. No. We'll see. We'll see. Ralph, what are you doing? Keep away from me. Ralph, please. Go. I can't. I can't do it. Oh, forgive me. It's all right, Ralph. Just lie down. There. I'm coming. I'm coming. Mr. Ellinger's expecting me. Oh, yes, sir. Come on in, won't you? Ah, Inspector Hadley. In here, if you want. Oh, thank you, sir. I believe you met my wife. Oh, yes, sir. Good morning, Mrs. Ellinger. It's hardly that, is it? No, I suppose not. But that boy's lucky. I saw Mr. Sanford again this morning. He could prosecute for trespass and the girl for assault, but they'd rather not. Why have you come, then? Oh, forgetting the Sanfords for a moment. In view of all that's happened, I'm of two minds whether or not to apply to have him remanded for a medical report. Is that necessary? Haven't we had enough trouble already? Look, Dr. Rooney's with him now. He's suggested that he gets away from here for a while. Oh, he has, has he? Well, I don't know whether I would advise that, sir. But everything's arranged. He's packed. The train leaves in 15 minutes and I've got his plane tickets. Hmm. Well, I don't want to hold him up, but I think I ought to have a word with Dr. Rooney first. Oh, you'll be down in a minute. Won't you take a seat? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Look, I'm sure you'll agree. A few months in the sun and Ralph will be as right as rain. All packed, Ralph? Very nearly, Doctor. What have you got there? Gin. You disapprove? I doubt if my saying yes will stop you. You know, I have a feeling I shan't see this room again. Now, that's nonsense, and you know it. Is it? Tell me, Dr. Rooney, what conclusion did you reach finally? Conclusion? Ah, don't hedge. The criterion of murder is menace of forethought. I can't believe that you would ever kill anyone deliberately in cold blood. But did I kill the girl, or didn't I? Now, listen to me, Ralph. From when we're so high, we have... We all have dreams and memories that alarm and torment us. I'm not a child anymore. This memory is real. The dividing line between reality and fantasy is a very thin one. Round and round and round. Don't you ever, ever say yes or no to a question? When I know the answer. <laughs> You're stumped. After all those tests and cosy chats we had, that doesn't say much for your noble profession, does it? I'm sorry. At least you listened. Oh, God, if they'd only charged me. It would have been so much easier. It's worse to punish yourself, isn't it? There's just no limit to one's own cruelty. I'm already building a dungeon inside myself. In time, you'll come to terms with it, Ralph. Oh, you're wrong, Doctor. I never shall. I must have a word with your father. I'll see you before you go. Uh, Dr. Rooney, this is Inspector Hadley. How do you do, sir? Hello. I said you thought it would be all right for Ralph to leave. Is that correct, sir? Is he quite normal? What's normal? Well, you know what I mean, sir. I'd hate a repeat of last night's little episode. Well, I don't think that's very likely, do you, Doctor? Well, sir, what's your verdict? I don't think you've grounds to confine the boy. But I am of the opinion it would be to his advantage to leave here. I see. Very well, Mr. Ellinger. He can go. Oh, thank you, Inspector. I'm very grateful for all you've done. I don't think I need to say more. Oh, that's all right, sir. I have a lad of my own. These things can happen in any family. And for that boy's lucky, he has a father like you. Oh, Ralph, come on down. Well, goodbye, sir, and goodbye, Mrs. Ellinger. Goodbye, goodbye, Inspector. Ah, already, are we, Ralph? More or less. Well, now, uh, don't go off without your ticket, will you? Oh, no. 
Well, I think this should see you through for a couple of months. What? Oh. Well, go on, take it. Just wire me if you need any more. Now I'll get the car round. Oh, no, don't bother. I can drive myself to oh, the station. Oh, no bother. I insist. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye, Ralph. You know where you can reach me, if you need to. Thank you. Goodbye, Ralph. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. Well, you know, Ralph, this is really an ideal time of year for a holiday. I wish I could leave the business and join you, believe me. Ah, well, you all know how things are. Yeah, of course. Ah, still, you have a good time. Yeah, which reminds me, there's a little place about ten miles south of Dijon called Mise saint georges It's a marvellous hotel there. Yeah, you're listening to me, Ralph? What? Oh, uh, yes. What are you looking at? Oh, those kids on the marshland. Ah, oh, you think their parents would know better than let them play there? Mm. Still, as I was saying, this, this wonderful little hotel. Your mother and I stayed there when we were first married. I haven't been back there since, but they, they're bound to remember me. Why don't you go down there? Food's excellent, and I promise you, you'll be comfortable. Pete, that policeman said we're not to play here. Why? We're not doing any harm. No, come on. We'd better go back and play in the yard. Here, wait a minute. There's something down there in the water. Where? There, look. Oh, it's only an old bag. Oh, look, careful. It's all covered in mud. There's a gold letter on it. M. Where? Mm, that's not gold. Oh, look, you've made me drop it. It sunk right to the bottom. So what? Who cares about it anyway? It's only an old bag. Come on, let's go. I'll beat you back. In Torment by Philip Levine, the part of Ralph Ellinger was played by Barry Foster and Dr. Rooney by Derek Bond. Frank Ellinger by Rolf Lefevre, Ruth Ellinger by Barbara Bolton, Inspector Hadley, Philip Morant, Sergeant Lumsden and Mr. Preedy, Peter Clawton, Flora, Priscilla Benson, Publican, Arthur Gomez, Mr. Ryder and Mr. Carstairs, Will Layton, Mr. Denton, Godfrey Kenton, Carol Sanford, Dorrit Wells, Constable Barclay, Michael Spice, Brenda, Patricia Bendall, Daphne, Patricia Cree, David, Terry Raven, and Pete, Jeremy Ranchev. The recorded production was by Robin Mitchley. <laughs>